Welcome back to the Pod of Greed. That is right. Happy to be here. Another Thursday. Good morning to everybody, or evening, or night, or whatever, whenever, whenever you're you, listening. During, at work, on the drive, whenever. Yeah, shout out to anybody here at the YouTube premiere in particular. Press one. All right. So, this is a very Yu-Gi-Oh! loaded week. Yeah, I mean, if you've been underneath a rock, uh, you've missed out on a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! discourse. Yeah, there is a lot of, uh, of Yu-Gi-Oh! to talk about, so we'll try to get through all of it, along with a few other stories here and there. We got a couple. So, uh, first, got a review to read for us. Uh, so, this person says, Amazing Podcast. This is by LMO81511. I was looking for a Yu-Gi-Oh! podcast, and you guys popped up, and wow, you guys put an amazing podcast and make it so entertaining. Keep up the good work. Hey. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm so to see a trend. I think Paul only reads the five-star ones. There is like a three-star one, actually. Oh, see, so you should have read that one. I'll read it, too. Oh, okay. Somebody says, Paul gets one star and Alec gets five stars. Hey. So it averaged to three stars. Keep up the good work. Wow. <laughs> Not cool, man. Not cool. <laughs> Anyways, we do appreciate you guys' reviews on any uh, platform you choose to listen, whether that's Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, anything works. You can follow the podcast. There's more places, places you can listen to it? There's plenty of places. Oh. Or you can just listen on YouTube. Okay, so we got to get into the Yu-Gi-Oh. The meat of it. It's yeah. a lot, yo. I'm not going to lie to you. So do you think we should like start with like the small stuff and then just like work our way yeah, up to the let's big stuff? Yeah, out the little things and then we get to the... Okay, cool. Well, in that case, uh, there's a new Speed Duel ban list. Yes, there is. Yep, I yeah. saw that. So, I don't know. Um, actually, you're the one who showed it to me, because I, I didn't did. know that it happened. I did show it to you. This actually even happened, like I think, before the last episode, and we just completely missed it. I think so, because I remember, I think I, I saw it after we potted. Yeah, so, um, potted. That's an interesting uh, like yeah, verb. I mean, it's a weird verb. To pod. Let's pod. Like um, a, a potted, a will pod. Attention speed duelist on January 10th will implement an updated events only forbidden limited list. So it's going to be used at all speed duel public events that are going to be held at like YCSs and stuff. The next one being the January Latin American remote YCS on January 27th and 28th. And then any and all speed duel public or main events after January 27th. Official tournament stores may use the list for their local speed duel tournaments as well. So, um, I know a lot of you guys listening at home probably don't follow speed duels, I would assume. But some of these some of these cars that got hit, you don't even need to be a speed duel player to real to figure out why. Yeah, um I know Alec, you've been doing even more, I think, speed duel like research and stuff than I have. So I keep my eyes open. You might have more insight than even I do. Although some of them I do know about, so um, we have our first forbidden speed duel card. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is the first time they've ever just outright banned a speed duel card. Just I didn't gone. think it was going to happen. It's not at three, not at two, not at one. I should probably mention um, the way the speed duel ban list works is, uh, is there a name for it? Like they use I don't know what you call it, really. I call them like conditional ban lists where it's sort of like that. Like you can only have X number of said types of cards. It's a, it's a strange yeah. thing. If like you know like duel links one, or limit. master duel, then you know how this works. Yeah, well, Master Duel doesn't have that, actually. They don't? Yeah, it's only Duel Links. Oh. There's, like, Limit 1, Limit 2, Limit 3. So, like, there's a bunch of cards in Limit 1, and you can only have, like, one of those cards. Mm-hmm. But the stuff in Limit 2, you can have a total of, like, two of those cards and so on. So, like, for instance, in Limit 3, some cards that have always been there, at least for a while, are, like, Book of Moon, D War Lady, and Cyber Dragon. DD War Lady wasn't there before. So, like, I could run, like, two DD War Ladies and one Book of Moon. I used to run three. Or I could run 3D War Ladies, but I wouldn't get to run any Book of Moon, for instance. Can't do that. Okay, so the first forbidden card is the My Precious Queen skill card for Weevil Underwood. It is kind of fitting that the first banned card is a skill card. Yeah, and one for Weevil as well. I think that probably... Such a pest. Yeah, that probably figures. So, yeah, this is the skill card that... um, I actually used this when we did our video about... Yeah, I hated um, you for it. Yeah, I did our our, our video on the last Speed Duel set. This skill card gives you a token at the end of each turn, and it's really pretty insane. So you get this token at the end phase of your turn and the end phase of your opponent's turn. It's this little insect token. Both end phases. And it's meant to be useful for, like, Insect Queen. Because she has to tribute something in order to attack. Mm -hmm. However, there are no conditions on this scale. You don't have to control an Insect Queen. You don't even have to control an Insect. Yeah, and you get it every end phase, which I know, like, in... Obviously, you know, master format, Yu-Gi-Oh, that's like nothing, right? Some little weak zero attack, zero defense token. 
But the fact that you're getting it every in phase and speed duel, which is like a format where nothing really, you know, decks can't just like kill you off of nothing entirely. And yeah, like it's very difficult having that amount of defense, like each turn can just make it really hard for people to kill you, really hard for you to like not be able to play. It's it's a really good skill. And I remember when we played it at first, I was like, my first thought was just like, man, is this a mistake? Like, did they forget to like, make it only one in phase or the other? I or? thought maybe we were interpreting it wrong, because I couldn't believe that this token was just coming out every single in phase. Yeah, and I kept reading, and I was just like, oh, yeah, this is what it does. So, And like for you guys who aren't too familiar with the speed duel format, things like this is a, like a kind of a time machine for Yu-Gi-Oh, where every single piece of card advantage, even a token, matters. Yeah, now what's a little bit strange about this is that they didn't just errata the skill because they have errated a number of skill cards in the past. Mm -hmm. um, Merrick's skill card got errated. One of Joey's One got of Joey's errated. did. I remember the early Serpent Knight Dragon one. That was a really yeah. popular one from those, like from that Rex starter deck. So the fact that they didn't errata this is a little strange. I thought they could have just made it one token, like in only like your in phase or only your opponent's in phase. Or you have to control an insect or something. Or like yeah, that. yeah, something like that. But they didn't. They just banned the card. I don't know if they'll retract that at all but i mean now with speed duel ban lists it's always a little interesting they typically make before now they were making a lot of ban lists specifically for events where it's like this is the ban list for this specific event and uh we're gonna use it here you don't have to use it at home yeah. yada 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 in this case they're making a ban list for this event and all future public events but I they mean, said that you they said specifically you can use this ban yeah. list at locals yeah and i mean like for what it's worth i think most places were you typically using these ban lists but um you know i see why somebody might you know just be like oh well, screw it i want to play my weevil deck so I'm going to not follow this list. It might be that they... Because typically when they errated the skills in Speed Duels, they put them out in the Speed Duel um, tournament packs, the errated versions. Yeah. But I guess they don't want to do that here. Okay, so some new limited one cards. Um, I don't know actually which ones of these are new per se. But, um, I think there's only I'm one. just going to attack and Twisted Personality. Were those both limit one before? Twisted Personality... If Twisted Personality wasn't limit one, it needed to be. Yeah, Twisted Personality That's the is generic like Merrick skill that... It's really annoying. Yeah, the Yami Merrick skill card. It's like whenever you would take damage, you get like a counter and then get to draw for it or something like that. If yeah, I'm you take damage, you get a counter, and then when you get enough counters, you can draw. And uh, that was just a very fun and easy to use skill. Just and also, I'm just going to attack, which is the Joey Wheeler skill. Which on first read, I cannot remember that skill's effect exactly. It didn't seem very busted, but essentially, it gave you one negate during the battle phase every turn which i imagine is like a pretty big deal not ban worthy but obviously like you know you can't use it alongside some of these other cards which are like golden ladybug offerings to the doomed floodgate trap hole nightmare wheel and zoma spirit i think those have all been there before, they've been though. there for a while a lot of those cards are part of the initial kind of stall deck that was going around in speed duels for a while limit two is cocoon of ultra evolution which I don't know if that's a new addition. Um, that's not new. I don't think it's new. Jinzo, Parasite, Paranoid, Allure of Darkness, Foolish Burial, Machine Angel, Ritual, and Reinforcement of the Army. Ooh, so many cards hit Limit 2. So, yeah, a lot of stuff in Limit 2. They did remove Volcanic Shell from it, though. So Volcanics need all, every shell they can get. And then um, Limit 3 is Cyber Angel, Ben 10, Breaker of the Magical Warrior, Cyber Dragon, DD Warrior Lady, Book of the Moon, Cosmic Cyclone, and Wall of Disruption. I know uh, when I was doing a little bit of research into speed duels, people were saying how like the Cyber Angel deck is really, really oh, strong. Oh yeah, it was crazy at one point. So I think limiting um, like Machine Angel Ritual and Cyber Angel Ben Ten is probably my good uh, calls. My my biggest understanding was how the speed duel kind of list works is everything in limit three is essentially them hitting staples, cards that when you run in three together just make your deck extremely solid, and they actually push a lot of other cards out of the metagame because they're really good. Yeah. And then limit two and limit one are to break down specific strategies. Yeah, limit one, limit two is more about strategies. I think limit three is exactly what you're saying. It feels like it's kind of just so people can't play basically like the three DD Warrior Lady, three Book of Moon, three Cosmic Cyclone, I was doing three Breaker, that. and like three Cyber Dragon. It's just the best cards in the game mm -hmm. all at three in a 20 card speed duel deck. It's like, it's just like, it's a good stuff deck at that point. Yeah. It's all the best cards. So, 
Yeah, it's just kind of a cool little bit that Speed Duel got an update. It seems like they always get their ban list at the beginning of the year. At least I'm remembering correctly. The last couple of years, it's been like in January. I mean, it could be they just want to get the work out of the way. Uh, you know, I know the team yeah. working on Speed Duels—they're not huge, so and they have other responsibilities. So um, it's good they're keeping up with it. They just have to you know, kind of get it out the way for now. Yeah, we actually are, um, I know we mentioned in the last podcast we wanted to try to do some speed duels. Mm -hmm. I actually found a list of all of the stores that did like the speed duel um, release event for the last set. Oh, yeah. Um, a year Streets ago. of Battle, well, no, Streets of Battle City. That was oh, about okay. six months ago. Um, so, might have to take a look at one of them. I mean, there are some that are fairly close to us, so those would be likely to have a speed duel locals. Why does it still sound like it's more than 50 miles away? I think it is. <laughs> it's worth doing a drive to play some speed duels, don't you think? I don't know. Like, that's a, uh, Maybe not. Well. Yeah, I got to play a lot of speed duels to make it worth it. Okay. Anywho, uh, next Yu-Gi-Oh! story then. Um, moving on to something similar to speed duels. Duel Links, actually. Mm -hmm. So tell me about this one-year anniversary. I've seen it, but you've played it, right? Well, this is their seventh anniversary, to be specific. So I said one year. Uh, anniversary. Coincides thing. with Yu-Gi-Oh! 7s being in Rush, I mean, being in Duel Links and bringing Rush Duels with it. But it's another chance to um, get a bunch of rewards like they do every year with their um, with their anniversaries. Lots of new skill, like ticket things, UR cards, lots of great stuff. And gems, gems galore. Um, the most important things to note is, I know... Rush Duel got a new structure deck. We got the um, ultimate flag, ultimate flag ace, multi, ultimate flag mech ace break. Okay, I can't get his name right, but we got a new Rush Duel uh, structure deck. As far as this on the Speed Duel side, we got a new selection pack which has. Many, actually, a lot of useful cards in it. Um, it has a reprints, or reprints of Cosmos in it. Uh, it has what I really want, and it upsets me, is that Shadal Beast is in there. You might remember that Shadals have recently come out in Duel Links. And That's so wild to Beast me. wasn't with the initial release. He's in the selection pack. And okay. I know you don't know what the selection pack is in Duel Links. No, it's probably similar to how they work in Master Duel, like the timed packs that have like, even specific worse. stuff. Oh, okay. Because these aren't even really timed. They're just price-gated. Oh, what do you mean? So by that? typically in Duel Links, you can use your gems to buy packs. So almost anything in Duel Links can be free to play if you grind enough. Almost. Okay. But selection pack cards, they are in a they're in a specific section away from the boxes, and you have to spend money. You have to buy them. Yeah, you. We well, don't have to buy them. You don't. Have to, you you don't have to buy them. But if you or want like, to get you want them, the cards in you them, have to you spend must spend money. Money. You, do, you don't get the Interesting. I didn't gems. know it was like that. Jeez, that's harsh. It is very harsh. So that really does feel a little pay to win. I remember people would always say like uh, that, like Duel Links was kind of over harsh in the monetization. But the, um, so typically, what what ends up happening with those selection packs, they'll take URs from different sets and put them in there. So you technically have a better shot at pulling the URs mm -hmm. if you, you know, spend real money. But lately I've noticed that they're also putting just kind of one-off pieces of archetypes in there, and that's the only way to get them, so... Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I was not aware of that. Well, um... So how have you been enjoying it? I mean, you've been playing it, I've right? been having a good time. I've been, I've been, uh, play, I've been playing a lot of Rush Duels, specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm using Rush Duels to build up my gems so I can get back into the uh, Speed Duel format. That says, that's weird because we just talked about Speed Duels. I've been playing a lot of Rush Duels so I can build up gems to get back into the Speed Duel format. And it's been a lot of fun. Right now, there's the tag event going on. Have you ever played the Duel Links tag event? I haven't. It's actually a pretty fun event. So... While you can't play tag duels normally in Duel Links, uh, during this event, they will pair you off with another NPC, and you'll face a tag team NPC duo, and you will share a field with your tag team partner, and you'll play a tag match against the AI. Um, at the lower levels, it's extremely easy, and it's brain dead. At the higher levels, it can actually be kind of fun uh, just seeing these different strategies kind of coexist at the same time. I find that a spe you, there's a different tier for every generation of Yu-Gi-Oh. There's a DM tier, a GX tier, you know. And you have to do a, you climb up to d higher, higher level difficulties. And what I found really fun was playing like Arc 5 Pendulums 
in the uh, in that tag mode, and I've enjoyed playing rush duels in that tag mode just because of their the way those types of decks work. It's interesting that they offer that for rush duel and speed duel. I mean, I guess they're not that different, but I just figured it'd probably be one of those features that's only for one or the other. They just added they just added it right in. It's another way to play tag duels. Just yeah, you know, I always got to give duelings credit for that too. Like, I think that just the variety of game modes helps that game so much. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a shame because I know, like, not that many people play Duel Links as much anymore. You know, Master Duel kind of did well, a I number on it. Well, I think people play it. They don't stream it. Yeah, but, yeah, I guess that's true. You don't see, like, a load of content. You don't see lots of streamers and stuff. There are lots of YouTube videos still, I think. But um, it's just there's so many more, like, game modes like that. Mm-hmm. Like, Tag Duel. Like, like, it's... um, I'll get into this a little bit uh, in a second when we talk a little bit more about Master Duel. But I do think, like, some mode variety would work wonders for some of people's like issues with master duel i think master Duel's issue is that it can't or it tries not to reference the anime as much as possible yeah they already kind of keep away from the anime they don't have any of the characters or any of the like kind of fun that can come of that like the 5d's world or like you know the dual taining world mm-hmm. or whatever but i mean i still think they could at least experiment with like modes but anyways yeah so as for duel links Sounds like seventh anniversary is good. It's a good time. Uh, Things are cool. Pick up your rewards, even if you're not playing actively. Just go ahead. It's a lot of free stuff. Go ahead and get it. Yeah, awesome. There's also a Duel Links video that I saw. So um, they're doing a like sort of Duel Links Duel Academy. I saw this on the Konami EU social media pages. Oh, okay. I was wondering you why I wasn't invited. You may have spotted this. Yeah. Um, they're basically doing something that's kind of similar to the Master Duel deck flexing series that we did, um, where basically... They have a mentor sort of figure mm-hmm. who is going to be... He was actually one of the commentators at Worlds this past year. Sasaki? Yeah. Oh. And um, he's going to be mentoring four different top players slash content creators from um, you know the EU region. And they're going to be playing Duel Links. I think specifically Rush Duel. That so, makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, there's a little trailer for it. I thought that was really cool for a lot of reasons. Um, I always love these content creator initiatives. Anytime that like creators are kind of getting involved in the Yu-Gi-Oh advertising kind of promotional process, that's really neat. I saw that they had like Jessica Robinson, for instance. You know, oh, uh, Sunseed Jess. She's known for playing Rika Sun Avalon among other decks. And you know, I thought that was just really neat. It seems a little bit to me though, like um, they probably need. Rush Duel to do a little better, so this is probably a you know a push for that. I mean, it's it can be, it's just tough. Uh, Duel Links already has an established audience, and you know they play Duel Links, they play Speed Duels. Rush Duels is completely separate. It doesn't benefit you all that much to play Rush Duels if you don't have an interest in it. Yeah, you can get a few more resources to spend on your Speed Duel deck, and um, honestly, I feel that. Rush duels don't even have enough. It is not really enough content in it yeah. to feel rewarding to a long time duel links player because you're just used to having so much to do as a speed duel player, and then the, the rank climb is so brutal. But in rush duels, it feels like uh, you know you you start it and then you're done. Yeah, I know you were complaining before about like how it's just a little bit mundane. Yeah, the um, like when you're just fighting the, the rush NPCs, duel NPCs are especially brain dead. I know the speed the duel links AI aren't great, but the rush duel ones are even worse. So those games aren't even close to being rewarding. The only way you, you get a rewarding game is if you play on the PvP ladder, and um, it feels like the P- the ladder ends really fast in duel in duel links. Like yeah, in rush duel you in, mean? Uh, yeah in rush duel duel yeah. links. That's always another thing. It's very hard to say. Yeah, like it's hard. It's you, hard to because like figure rush, out your terminology. Because like there's rush duel, which is like a physical thing in Japan, but, it's a digital but then it's like thing a digital here. thing here. Only and it's in a duel mode links. within duel links, so you can't just say I'm playing rush duel. You have to say like, oh, I'm playing like rush duel in duel links, and then like now there's a distinction between rush duel and like speed duel. Which speed duel is like what duel links was, but also it's a physical product here, which and is not duel links. Yeah, and so it's just it's very like. Marketing and like recognizability wise, the like marketer brain in me is always just like, oh my god, I, I don't envy that problem. Like, and it's there are there are a bunch of kind of a UI kind of I, w- I won't call them issues exactly in Duel Links now, idiosyncrasies, but they have to separate everything now by being say, either he has a rush label on it or a speed label on it. And which I guess it's is all good a bit more it. confusing to look at now. I won't lie to you, like. 
Yeah, like I said, I think that they probably are wanting to push Rush Duel a bit more. I know, you know, we did some promotional material for it as it was releasing mm -hmm. last year, but um, I think that it has definitely cooled off some. Uh, whenever I go to like look for content, it just doesn't seem like it's they, really. They really need to hurry up and get to what I call the good stuff in Rush Duels. What is the good stuff? So right now we're kind of in the ba the bare bones. We're in the like LOD era of Rush Duels, mm -hmm. but what I, I keep track of what comes out in Japan, they have much more interesting and exciting strategies and lots of like legacy support in Rush Duels that we don't have in Duel Links, and I think people would take a vested interest. In seeing like the new cyber dragons, the new harpies, the new red eyes. Yeah, if you know how far behind is the stupid far. Okay, so the, it's the, very far. That's what I was gonna say. How far behind is the card pool in like Duel Links Rush Duel from actual Rush years. Duel in Japan? Oh, like years behind. Yeah, oh, like goodness. we're not we're not close. We're not oh, close at sucks. all. I see. I feel like they need to. That's always been this thing with these like Yu Gi Oh video games in general is they're always very like. They just have a thing with, like, keeping card pools behind for some reason. I don't know if it's, like, to not, I guess, um, pull away from sales. Like, you know, they don't want to cannibalize sales. So it's like, oh, you got to get the physical cards to play them first and then, like, wait X months or whatever to get them in, like, the digital game. But I just think, like, it really is a shame because in Rush Duel in particular, if a lot of those new cards are, like, Cyber Dragons, Harpies, you know, stuff that people Cyber really Dragons recognize. Cyber Dragons are actually old now in Rush Duels. Hopefully they can like catch that up. I mean, do they? We're so we're so far behind, Paul. There, I can there I can think of distinctive like meta formats in the physical rush duel game that we're nowhere. We're not we're not even close to. It's like God, hey, we have a long way to go. Well, that's see, that's a shame. I mean, like Master Duel kind of gets away with it, but like I think Duel Links, you need to kind of hurry up. Yeah, I think people are losing interest. And then, you know, if you are an avid Rush Duel follower, you're you know, you you've been you've watched the latest Rush Duel anime, which is uh was that Go Rush. But yeah, so they're not even like we're close in to that. Sevens, yeah, they're still in sevens. And we're in like early sevens. I mean they already announced like a Go Rush season two, so Yeah. So, you know Yeah, that's no good. I'd like to see some updated Rush Duels because uh, there are a lot of cool cards. I, but yeah, as for like the um, sort of Duel Links, Duel Academy, or Rush Duel Academy video, I will be watching it. It's going to be on the Yu-Gi-Oh! EU channel. As always, EU kind of tends to do a bit of a better job than NA when it comes to Konami and like working with creators. The, uh, they, they certainly have a different culture over there. Yeah, like they really have a good relationship with their content creators. Mm -hmm. I wonder what that's like. Well, um, anywho... I think that's all for Duel Links. That's fair. That's fair. I will now talk about my experiences with Master Duel. Oh, you did have a moment, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I had a moment last night. Several moments of frustration. But no, I managed I to hear. reach uh, Master Duel Tier 1 last night. I'm happy to say, yes, hold your applause and wait until the end of the two-hour-long podcast. No. Tier 1? I thought you were playing a Tier 2 deck. Well, it feels like I am. So yeah, I managed to reach Master Duel or Master Rank 1. And um, I was playing Vanquish Soul, just climbing the ladder. Absolute, complete, just nightmare. To be completely honest, like <laughs> it, it was, I, it was so brutal. I mean, I know like these match duel formats are always pretty rough, so that's not like anything new. But oh, man, I tell you, it's playing master duel at you know it, within those sort of master rank tiers. Everyone is really good. Mm -hmm. People are very aware of you know. All of the strategies, all of the tricks, the tech cards are brutal. Everything is just really, really, um, it's cutthroat. And also, you know, I was playing a lot against a lot of super heavy samurai decks, a lot of branded decks, a lot of labyrinth decks, a lot of cybers, pile decks. That's probably the top four, maybe Manadium in fifth place. How many duels did you have to do after you made it to Master Rank 2? Oh, so many, yeah. Uh, for people who are maybe just listening and don't know how the Master Duel rank up system works, it's a little, it's simple, but like kind of annoying. Um, so basically, like, you know, if you're in Master Rank 5, let's say, mm -hmm. you have to win five games in order to rank up to Master Rank 4. And then you do that all the way until you get to like one. The thing is, though, it's not just winning five games, it's like winning five straight. If you won five straight, then that would like take you there. But if you lose a game at any point, then it like throws you down one. So, like, if it says, oh, I need three more wins to get to the next rank, 
and I lose, then now I need four more wins, which means I have to make like basically one win to get back where I was, and then win that game again. Ah, so okay. So, so you don't really have to hit five straight, but yeah, but you do need to be like kind winning of... more than you're losing. And if yeah. you lose too many, you'll eventually even get demoted into like maybe a lower rank potentially. So it can be really, really brutal. And because these are like best of ones, you know, coin flips really yeah, plays a big role and How all that. How many times were you demoted in Master Rank? So I'll tell my story, actually. Uh, <laughs> I got demoted plenty of times. But when I was in Master Rank 2, trying to get to Master Rank 1 with my Vanquish Soul deck, it was very nerve-wracking. But the way that it basically worked was I, I did it once earlier yesterday and, like, lost and whatever. So then I made it back there. And there so this is as in... there is an one game to go to get to Master Rank 1. Okay. One win away. And here's my experience in, in a single session. I first played against a Labyrinth deck. Okay. It out-resourced and out-grinded me. They're good at that. Very annoying deck. Hate it. Um, it, was, it started off pretty well, and then it just went downhill. Okay, great. I lost. I was like, oh, all right. So then I had to play against something to make it back there. I don't know what, you know, some random deck. And then I got back to, you know, being... On the bubble or whatever we want to call that. We'll call and it the rank bubble. Up match. Like yeah, it. back on the bubble. And so then I played against a Branded deck, which also out-resourced me and just completely, because Branded's nuts. And I'm going to go into detail about each of these decks, or somewhat detail in a second. Um, it beats me. So I get tumbled down again. And then this time I beat some other deck, get back on the bubble, play against a Cybers deck. Now, this one pissed me off. I'll tell you why. <laughs> so everybody hates Math Mech Circular and all that jazz, right? Nobody likes that card. It's annoying. But generally speaking, just Cybris Pile is one of the most lethal decks. It can kill you out of nowhere. Um, you know, it can go first and make a crazy board, or it can go second and just kill you. Like, just kill you. There was Good old Axis Double code. attacking Axis Code Auker, or now um, Firewall Dragon, Dark Fluid, Neo, Terahertz, or whatever. Oh, the Link 5? Firewall Tempest... Link five, link six, it's something. Link six. Yeah, there's like a, there's a link five, there's link six. I don't remember which one it is, but basically, thing is huge. It gains enormous amounts of attack points, and it like sends cybers cards from your deck or the extract to the graveyard to like use its effect. And so the thing is, like it, all the different cybers monsters that it can send give like additional effects. Like there's Desave Worm can negate stuff from grave. There's one thing in the grave you can let it attack twice. That's how it usually kills you. So it like ups its attack points to like. 10,000 or something in attacks. It's just something you like said that. said 10,000, like that's a normal number. Like, it's, oh, yeah, it's nuts. Well, anyways, uh, the reason I lost this game was because we kind of went a little back and forth. I managed to stop his opening combo. I stopped his Math Mech Circular with like a Droll and Lockbird. And we were kind of just shimmying for a bit. On my turn, he Max Seed me, and then I used Triple Tactics Talent. I got to look at his hand. He had a Parallax <laughs> Seed in his hand yeah, and then yeah, two yeah. Ash Blossoms in his hand. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to take away Parallel Exceed because I know that's really dangerous and that could, you know, cause me to lose the game. Then I summoned, um, like, a Vanquish Soul Raisin to force out one of his Ash Blossoms, attacked a couple of things, his board's empty, and then I ended my turn. And I was like, okay, I've got this guy dead to rights. This is going to be it, right? This is it. Game point. And he draws and normal summons his Ash Blossom, which typically in Master Duel, like, you take that to mean, like, okay, they're giving up. Like, they'll normal summon their Ash Blossom and just, like, swing into your monster and whatever. No, actually. You normal summon his Ash Blossom, link it away into a Salamangrate Almirage, and since, he, since he'd done a link summon, it activates in his hand Parallelic Seed that he drew that <laughs> turn. He top decked a Parallelic Seed, special summons it, does some long combo after that with, you know, Splash Mage and Transcode Talker and all that BS. And then summons the Firewall Dragon Neo Tempest Terahertz and OTKs me with like ten thousand attacks. Honestly, they deserve that. And one. I was so upset. I they, I was I was they like, earned that. I was about to quit for the night at that point because <laughs> I'd done this three times: like lose to Labyrinth, lose to Branded, lose to Cybers in just the worst way. And then like each time you do it, you got to play another game to get back there. And it's like usually getting Super Heavy Samurai, and that deck's annoying. And I finally make it back. And in my last game, I actually managed to win against like a Zodiac deck. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's just a Zodiac deck. Zodiac. It was fairly tame. Zodiac. When Zodiac is light work. <laughs> yeah, so not to get into um, too much like nitty-gritty detail about it than that, but it was really rough. Um, I am proud of myself. Pretty happy. Hopefully, um, I can do that again next season. So, 
I guess we're not going to hear much more about you playing Massa Duel until uh, the next Duelist Cup, huh? We're gonna make oh, I won't be it? playing in a Duelist Cup. I'm not. You, you're yeah, ready I'm, now. I can't do that. You're Master One. But I will give um, my quick synopsis, because people tend to like to hear about this, about the actual format that's currently in Master Duel. Okay. Um, I might make a, like, a dedicated video for this on the channel, but just in brief, I think Super Heavy Samurai is insanely strong. Way too many extenders. Uh, the problem I have with the Super Heavy Samurai deck, and you actually kind of know a little bit about how Super Heavy Samurai work, is that they've just drained it of all the personality. This sort of meta build that people play mm -hmm. doesn't really have much of anything to do with, like, attacking in defense mode or any oh, of the no. sort of gimmicks that made them Do unique. they even run Ben K? I mean, they run, like, some of their synchro boss monsters that can attack in defense mode, so, like, that can happen, but it really is just spamming searches and summons over and over and over and over and over. The deck's got a lot of gas. It's pretty boring. Um, and, yeah, if you don't have Droll and Lockbird, you usually kind of just got to pray. I mean, the deck has FTKs. The deck's got hand loops. The deck, I, I've seen hybrids of it with every other kind of, every card in the book. I've seen, like, a Kashdira hybrid. Some Yang Zing thing, a Sword Soul one. I've seen all kinds of stuff. It's really wild. How massive do play players are wild. Yeah, there's just so many things. And then, like, this Branded, which is, uh, it just recurs too many resources, honestly. Gets obnoxious amounts of advantage. All their cards come back in the end phase. Didn't Branded get hit? Yeah, it's interesting. They got hit, but then they got their little final round of support with, like, Guiding Quim and Albion the Sanctifier Dragon. And they were just fine. And they were A-OK. -okay. And, I mean, Branded Fusion being at one, I think, is totally, like, fine and should never move from there. They have <laughs> so many ways to search that card and recycle it over and over and over again. Like, they, like, they will never, I'm I telling feel you. feel like... When that, when I remember when we talked about that ban list, we were like, oh man, they're really mean to Branded, hitting yeah. it to one. I take it all back. <laughs> I hate Branded now. And then uh, Labyrinth is still just Labyrinth. It's really, really good. And uh, the Manadium deck is also like a thing people play. It's pretty obnoxious as well. It just combos. It doesn't end on any of the Visus monsters. It just uses them as a... The Visus and the Manadiums and all that stuff, it just uses them as a means to an end to get to like... Dispater, Barone. Ah, uh, the usual uh, suspects. Barone and friends. And uh, Cyber still is obnoxious too. You should probably hit Mathmic Circular or maybe, hell, even like Splash Mage or something. I don't know. There's some of these little Cyber extenders, they. I'm feeling a bias against rough. combo decks here. Yeah, I don't like them. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing is, I think it would. I would call it a bias, except that, like, this actually is all that you'll see. That you don't really see control decks in master rank, and I think that's a bit of a shame that there isn't more of a balance. I think the most you'll, the closest you'll get to seeing control is labyrinth, and like even that is such a obnoxious, almost like cheating levels of strong type of mm -hmm. control. You know, they get to play in your first turn, they pull cards from your hand before you get to, you know. So like there is like a control deck, but the vast majority of what you'll be facing is pretty high combo stuff. So. And you're over here with... And I'm playing Vanquish Soul. Soul, which I think is like bringing a knife to a gunfight against the Avengers <laughs> or something. Like, it, it's very, you know, it's rough. But that's enough about Master Duel. Um, it was fun. Congrats to me. I'm very happy. Okay. Uh, I guess... Now we can get into the uh, the nitty gritty. Yeah, the the big the the bigger discussions in the Yu Gi Oh community. Well, there's one last story actually. I want to oh, get out okay. of the way. So we opened the um, what was it called? The quarter century oh, the OCG quarter century product. Yeah, I forget what's exactly called. Is it around here somewhere? I think I threw the box away now, uh, but it was called some. Yeah, it's the quarter century duelist box. Um, it was sent to us by Yu Gi Market. It's an OCG product, and I just wanted to shout out the opening experience of that. Because it was really good. Yeah. Um, OCG products are a delight to open as compared to TCG products. They try to they try to put more in them so you feel like, you know, you're getting more out of them. Because mm -hmm. that box came with, it came with the packs, of course. It had packs. Well packaged. Then it came with a deck box mm -hmm. and a card case so you can display your best pull. Yeah. And, uh, I think and you even get, like, a token is. pack. Yep, and you get a token pack. You get a token, too, or some tokens. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. So you get, like, nine packs, and the packs have only four cards each. 
and then you get like a token pack, which is four t- or three or four tokens. Mm-hmm. And the rarities look cleaner, the print quality is better. Like the cards are just they, they feel a little bit like sturdier. Um, I can actually read the text on their quarter century secret rares, unlike in the TCG where I always have a tough time like reading the card name. Sadly, it doesn't matter how they print Japanese. I can't read. But it. yeah, I obviously can't read the language, but just the you know the print quality itself is really good, and it feels like it's a very considerate of like the Mm -hmm. of the person like they're trying to give you a really good experience and i think that they did not have to give you like a a little deck box you put together but it's that was fun i like putting together those little deck boxes yeah you put the the deck box together and it kind of made me think you know like for a lot of people um oh you got it right there here's the deck box yeah like um for a lot of people they might just buy packs and like they buy them on a whim right and then you open Mm -hmm. your packs in your car and you realize like oh man where do I put these cards? Yep, I have nowhere to go. And so by giving you, like, the deck box there... We put the cards in the box. Yeah, I think that's really cool. Um, and same with the frame. So it's like, hey, if you pull something really good, you know, you can frame it up. And they even include a sleeve along with the frame, like a clear sleeve and mm. all that stuff. So it's like... We pulled a... Uh, oh, we probably shouldn't tell them. They're going to see the video. Yeah, watch the video. We, we pulled a quarter century. Yeah, we pulled a quarter century. It was really cool. Um, You know, like, TCG doesn't feel like it is as, like... it's No, I don't want to say that, like, TCG's opening experience is, like, bad. It just feels like it's straight to the point. Mm-hmm. We're here for cards, and that's what you get when you open up the box. I yeah, mean... Like you know what you're here for. We don't care about, like, you feeling good or bad about it. You just get the cards. Because our products are strictly just the set. It's just the packs, the cards, some box toppers. Um, that's, this is the second time we've opened up one of these kind of, like promo boxes from the OCG mm-hmm. and they always just load them up with extra stuff you're not just getting cards yeah and I think you're getting a Yu-Gi-Oh experience I mean I think it does seem like they just they they, they care about the player like the opener experience mm-hmm. so um, I would love to see also okay another thing I don't know what like maybe we'll be getting some of the cards in this set soon but like the fact that we were just casually able to like open with like access code talkers like from packs and like yeah. Ash Blossoms and just all these things I was like man this is like Rarity Collection 2. It, and they actually had Rarity Collection in the OCG, mm-hmm. and we're still pulling staple, like, good staple cards. Like, which, it's just kind of wild. Like, maybe, you know, obviously, like, I'm not in Japan, right? Like, I don't play Yu-Gi-Oh! But Japan. we can be. <laughs> but it's so, like, I don't know. that I'm sure the OCG has its downsides, so maybe the Yu-Gi-Oh! experience over there is different or worse in some way. But from every little slice of it that I do get to experience, it really does feel like they're a lot more considerate of just... The player experience, so. I can just imagine OCG players are opening up these packages like, why do I keep putting so much garbage in my cu- my card packs? Ah, throw yeah, they, away. they hate it. Come over to America. We've got plenty better products for you. All right. Well, now I think we actually have uh, talked our way to the big story. Controversy in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community. Yeah, because there's been a fair bit of it. All three You've of these... have been arguing everywhere. Yeah, there's three different stories, and they all basically involve community discourse, disagreement, drama, and controversy. And content creators. Yeah, in many cases, content creators as well. Okay, we're going to start in uh, chronological order, I suppose. Okay, so what was the so first thing? The first thing, I guess, was kind of the, the price drama. It's just been going on. Yeah. It's just been going on. Um, for those who, I guess, have been living under a rock, you know, Bonfire was in, it's in like Mesa Bolinia, which, by the way, is coming out this week. So that, that's good news. Let's see if them pre sale prices hold up. Yeah, which they hopefully won't. But yeah, it's the price of Bonfire and then the general price of just like the engines that are needed in modern Yu Gi Oh today the SP yeah. Little Knights, the Msetis, the, uh, what is the other card? The Wanted. This, the ongoing pricing issue of competitive Yu-Gi-Oh. Mm. But this was all, uh, you know, started by when people started posting the pre-sale prices for Bonfire. And that got people a little hot under the collar. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was leading you in. Oh, no, I mean, I just said, yeah, people have been going on. on. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, um, I mean, it's just been, I've seen just nothing but just social media posts. Everyone's kind of weighing in. There's There is the crowd that says, well, you know, like, if you can't afford Yu-Gi-Oh, too bad. Like it's a, it's a, um, what are their words? I mean, I've seen like some people call it a luxury. Some people call it, you yeah. know, like you gotta pay to play. Like that's how it is. It's an expensive hobby. Deal with it. I will quote a tweet by some Yu-Gi tuber whose name will not be mentioned. Uh, Yu-Gi-Oh is cheap. 
compared to Yu-Gi-Oh! is not. Stop mixing these two. Any hobby, if you want to compete at the highest level, has a cost. Yu-Gi-Oh! is cheap. Oh, that's Susu and Jinjin, right? I wasn't going to say anybody's names. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, head-to-head battles. I saw they were um, getting into the discourse with... They were getting into it with people on Twitter. I'll tell you why. All right, Paul. So, yes or no, do you agree? I mean, I really don't even remember the tweet, but... I just read it aloud. But... um, Gun to your head. Do I... I mean, uh, with what? Yu-Gi-Oh! was cheap. Competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! was not. Stop mixing these two. I think that I would say I... uh, I get the gist of what they're saying. I think I, I can agree with that much. Okay. I right. think what's tricky about these conversations... Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think what's tricky about these conversations is just that, like, what they're saying isn't untrue, right? Mm-hmm. It's just that the reality itself is what people take issue with. It's, and yeah. so, it's not that, like, I think anybody's, like, angry at, you know, Susu and Jinjin for stating what is... Pretty much is what it is, right? Like... Competitive Yu-Gi-Oh's can, can be pretty expensive to play, and casual Yu-Gi-Oh can typically be pretty cheap to play. It's more that I think people feel that it shouldn't have to be that way. And I feel right. that it shouldn't have to be that way. I mean, I think, like, it sucks when you are um, not able to, you know, like, afford cards. Like, especially if you want cards for maybe a more casual deck. Like, Bonfire is not a... I mean, like, it's going to be used competitively, but it's also a card that you might use in your fun Volcanic deck or your fun, like you know, Flamville deck. Mm-hmm. And so that still is kind of impeding on your ability to play them. And then similarly, like some people feel that competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, it is expensive, but maybe it shouldn't be expensive. Like, why does it have to be expensive? Like, I think that for some people, the goal would be more so to focus on the skill involved rather than the price involved. Right. So like, we all have access to the same card pool, but, you know, so so that way it's like, Am I better than you, not do you have more money than me type of thing? It's it's kind of funny. You know, we look at Pokemon as an example of a game that can be competitive but doesn't have to be expensive. The uh, Pokemon card game prints all of their meta-relevant cards at multiple rarities where you can pick your own price point with that game. But in Yu-Gi-Oh!, we have a, our card distribution is dependent upon the rarity, and they, cards are not printed in more than one rarity, so... Cards can get price gated by the secondary market, and that can make it very hard to compete with the cards you want to compete with because there's just they're scarce and people have marked the prices up so high that you can get priced out of the game. Now yeah. to be clear, that's actually not on that's actually not on Konami as far as the price gating of the cards. They don't actually set the prices. They they set the distribution, which that's something they can work on. Yeah. Um it's I tell you, man, this this one is a debate that has gotten kind of to the point where, uh, I don't know, I hate that it has to be one. Does that, you get what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, because I think that I would rather be arguing about what cards are broken or like what decks are too good or how do you beat certain decks than arguing about can you afford said deck or can right. you afford said card? Because in a way, like, it's kind of a boring argument to have. Like, we get it, the cards are expensive, but... It sucks because I guess we're powerless to do much to change it. Like, there are some things Konami can do. Whether or not they'll do them is so feels so far out of our control that I actually, in sometimes when I read these arguments, I almost hate it because I feel like it's just Yu-Gi-Oh players going at Yu-Gi-Oh players' throats over a thing that isn't. Like, let's say that, like, you and I are on different sides of the fence. Or maybe you are. No, we are literally are. I don't agree with you. Different sides of the table, for sure. I I disagree with you. Or let's say that I, like, you know, I have it out with, like, a viewer or a listener. Oh, yes. You can all get it. And I disagree. Like, you think that, let's say, let's just say that, like, you think cards should be cheap. All the cards should be, be. you know, affordable. And I say no. Elitist trash. I say that, you know, if you want to play bonfires, you should have to pay this much money and tough luck live with it. Right? The thing is, maybe... Uh, let's say you've got, like, some really good reasons why you think the game should be cheaper. Mm-hmm. And, like, ways that you think it could be cheaper. And so we argue on Twitter all day long. You and I were just going at it. 24 right? our, our straight computers hours. hunched over at these keyboards. Having gone to the bathroom, having done nothing. Well, I went to the bathroom, at least. Uh, you lost but something. But the thing is, even if, like, in all seriousness, though, like, even if I convince you, what changes? Like, let's say I managed to convince you, right, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I've got these... 
logical, rational arguments and stuff. And I managed to, I get Alec to concede to me that it's okay that these cards are expensive. Let's assume that, right? But nothing like changes. Or maybe if you manage to convince me that the prices should be cheaper mm-hmm. and that like Konami should print stuff this way and it's unacceptable that it's like this. The two of us on Twitter. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's no, uh, there's nothing we can do about it because the people who are the cause of the situation are the vendors who sell the cards and the people who um, make their little TCG player accounts and Konami. They're the only people that have any power to change this. Um, we argue about it. We don't set prices. Our, our issue is because we have to buy them. Our issue is that we are the consumer here. Yeah. It can, it just, I guess it, it underscores the entire thing with a bit of like, um, like it's kind of all for naught. It make it reminds me of an argument I made some weeks ago. It's like, um, you know, it's un, it's insensitive, but just don't buy them. Um, that's the only power you have in this situation. As a consumer, you can either buy or you cannot buy. And if you want to have any say in the pricing of Bonfire, you have to not buy it. That's yeah. The only that's it's the, the only thing you got. can do, and it's unfortunate because that doesn't really do much. Like I think that that's the extent of what we're able to do, and it isn't much because there are players who need bonfires and will buy them for that price. The, the, there are players that is who are willing and able to afford bonfires, and they become yeah they become the winners because they're like oh yay only we can use this card we happy few get to yeah. use this powerful expensive card. And that price gates like snake eyes and all kind of other strategies from players who choose not to. It it's is interesting. Kind of a garbage situation. It's interesting because, like, I guess there's like a bit of a uh, like Yu Gi Oh almost has this kind of suspension bridge effect or something. Mm-hmm. Maybe I don't know if that's like the best term for it, but it's it's just like okay, you can sit here and you know buy these cards for this price and justify it in your head, but it really does suck that there are. Like, okay, if you're going to, like, if you're a YCS, you know, regular, you go to your regionals, you go to your YCS events, you're here, you're competitive, you're here to top, and you have no problem paying the price for Bonfire. I still think that really sucks, though, because, like, you've been, like, kind of conditioned into just paying 100 bucks for these cards. Now, whether or not you, the competitive player, feel bad about that or not, maybe you've come to terms with it yourself, but I still think that more abstractly, Mm -hmm. that really sucks. Like, that we've just, like, the Yu Gi Oh has just, Worn a lot of people down to the point where they're not really interested in questioning it. They just want the cards. It can. It's interesting. Um, with the price, with this kind of casual way our cards are trending upwards, I wonder if Yu-Gi-Oh is becoming more of a rich man's game. Because you know, there's a lot of hobbies like that tweet said. There are a lot of hobbies that actually are quite expensive. You want to get into golf. You're gonna pay. You want to get into like formula, like formula racing. You're going to pay, and it's just weird to ever think that a card game, game would be that way. Would be could be like a luxury kind of hobby, but like that's if you want to compete at the highest level of this game, price can't be an issue for you, like because they cards casually hit the hundreds right now. I know, just on the regular, and you can say, okay, I just won't play that deck. But let's but then be when honest. that deck is the happens to kind of be the thing Konami's pushing, and it's like right. the strongest option available. That's the best thing you can like. Let's say it's not even necessarily the best thing that you could be playing, but like you found a specific strategy that you want to exploit with this with this strategy for this YCS that you think is going to be the your chance to win or just get a high placing. It would be horrible if you can't do it just because, oh, bonfires are 130 bucks a piece and, you know, you're a little light this month and you can't afford them. Now you got to play a different strategy. And then someone takes the strategy you wanted to play and wins the event with it. Yeah, that feels like a slap in the sick. face. It's, it's very, it's rough. And, like, I've seen some people tweeting stuff like, you know, like, can you guys just, like, shut up about the stupid price thing? Like, it is what it is. Right, like I've seen a lot of those opinions too. That's kind of, I guess, what Head to Head Battles was sort of saying. It's just that at the end of the day, like I don't know that <sighs> they're right in that, like it isn't really. It's it feels out of our power to change. Mm-hmm. But I do also think that the talking about is probably the best thing we can do. Like outside of obviously, yeah, don't buy your hundred thirty dollar bonfire things, sure. But like, just. It, I do know that Konami watches social media, 
They right? got eyes on it, yeah. Like, they have eyes on it. Um, for anybody who's, you know, who ever thought Konami is completely ignorant to what goes on, no, I can say with full certainty, they're aware. They're, like, scouring, you know, Facebook, Reddit, you know, all those places. I know that they've got people on that. So they do see the conversations, whether or not they can change them, you know, being a company that is for profit, obviously, you know, they've got a business model to maintain, but I do think that it's probably worth it to at least talk about it, even if it is tiring and even if it is, can feel futile. Even if it causes a rift between you and your favorite content creators. Which I do feel bad about that. I saw some um, people were very upset with head-to-head battles for that tweet. Now, granted, I saw that they were they were fighting in the comments. They, they were they they weren't taking L's. They, they were responding they were, to people, and they were it was it was a it was a time. And I guess just I will say I always advise like if you're a content creator or like kind of any sort of internet personality celeb, I always approach like Twitter with a grain of salt. Like, don't you know? Don't let it. I think arguing with people on Twitter is not good for your mental health. Let's put it that way. No, nah, but it's not. but as they were. You know, that's fine. That's their choice. I saw that they were definitely, you know, hashing it out with people. And it seemed like some people were maybe disillusioned a bit. I know I said this like last week where it feels like sometimes your content creators, they're the ones you kind of expect to stand up for you and share your Mm -hmm. views. And so if they say an opinion that feels like it's, um, you know, it doesn't feel like it's in your best interest as a viewer, it doesn't align with your interest as a viewer. And then there's like kind of a, a, a weird rift, and the parasocial thing breaks, and yeah, and that's no good. I mean, like I've people have gotten mad at like you know, center this on the table. Um, <laughs> like, I mean, I've had like people get like mad at me or you or whatever for like not ex- me ex- oh, uh, <laughs> expressing things. I read. I mean, I read comments on this podcast. You do too, right? Like you know, I mean, people sometimes when I don't read the ones I don't like. Yeah, when sometimes when, when we say things that like people don't like, people will get like pretty nasty about it but i guess i always have to remind people too that like your favorite content creators they're just Yu-Gi-Oh players still they're like just they people just, there's people they just have opinions that maybe happen to be different than yours and, and you know your views let them buy expensive pieces of cardboard like bonfire yeah so uh maybe maybe if you disagree with them just don't watch anything of theirs and then they won't be able to afford it yeah, that's an, that's an evil strategy. I'll let you guys know right now I'm not buying bonfires. Yeah, just don't I do that for us, by it. the way. Please keep watching. I'm, I will buy steel product and hope I pull bonfires. Yeah, that's the thing. So I should I should probably mention like our place and all this. Um, I'll still buy like a box of Maze of Millennia. I, I, I buy a box of like pretty much every set. So like, I'll, I'll try to get two boxes. I'm going to try and get yeah, two. He's more of an addict. If I, can, if, I, if I can just pull two bonfires, I'm in. I mean, I was talking to Troll the other day, and he was just like, yeah, I'm just gonna get bonfires. Oh yeah, he, yeah he'll do thing it. Is like he, he's just gonna do it. He's he's in that camp of people who like he's got to get the cards you know, and he's to compete. He, they want to win, and they, he knows what it takes to win. And he's just resigned himself to. I mean, maybe resigned isn't even a good word, but like he is okay with that. I, like, mean, I think players like Tro who've been in the game for a long time. I mean, competitively, they um their mindset's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. They've dealt with all of this before. They've felt the pain of not having enough money to compete with the very best cards in a format. They don't want to deal with that anymore. Yeah, they, I think that they've made the decision that it's just not... It, the price isn't a factor. They will get the card. They will do what they have to do. They'll, like, pay who have to pay. They'll, they'll And to waste the time talking about it is not productive to them. They would rather just be playtesting. Because they want to win. And granted, like, that's a, that's a valid, I think, like kind of stance to have about it is just that like who cares i'm getting the card so i can go win like i'm i'm we do not not just like they would say like we don't need to waste this time like arguing about it i just want to play test with it and like take it to the event and win so that's another another thing guys uh if you really want bonfires and can't afford them um, if you put up results, you can get sponsored and have your sponsor pay for them. Don't listen to him. <laughs> just li- <laughs> Look, what? Just you know how many competitive players are just sponsored, and that's how they get all their shiny cardboard. That's true. I will say, okay, I'll I'll concede this point. Make some friends and borrow it from them. Honestly, <laughs> I mean that's what I've traditionally. That's kind of what I've done with expensive cards. If a friend's got them, they're not using them that weekend. Here, let me borrow your hundred dollar droplets or whatever. Because if you're not playing this weekend, that's it's economical. Or buy proxies. Honestly. Well, you can't take those to tournament. Yeah, I mean, but you, you can, can, but you'll get in a lot yeah, of yeah, trouble. Don't, don't play them in tournaments. I do that. But I mean, like, listen, if you're just, you know, playing at the kitchen table. Me, 
buy some proxies and just move on with your life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, look, I was gonna say now, my I got proxy bonfires. They already, they already ordered. Like, oh really? Did you actually order some? Yeah, I ordered them. Oh okay, it was like six bucks. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I was gonna say too. I mean, you can that, or you can wait for the inevitable bonfire reprint. I'm sure it'll be an ultimate rare in an OTS pack soon. <laughs> Konami's gonna be like, yeah, we heard your concerns. Yeah, just win a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we, we heard your concerns. We've reprinted Bonfire. It's not an ultimate rare in the OTS pack. Just, just win a lot. So just win a lot, and, and you can lucky. have a chance at pulling that. Mm-hmm. It'll cost two hundred bucks instead. You wanted to reprint so much, well then fucking take it. That's what they say. It'll drive the price down, I'm sure. Yeah, it'll make the regular ones a little cheaper. <laughs> that's, that's all. There'll um, be one hundred and fifteen. Okay, well, anyways, I guess any verdict on, on the price thing? Do you ha- Has your I mean, opinion been swayed? I do don't thinking? want cards to be that quite as expensive as they've been. It was one thing, because, you know, the, fir- the first, like, truly expensive card to me was a uh, prize card Minerva back in, yeah. like, 2013, 2014, somewhere around Like right 15, now. maybe. 15? Okay. Yeah. Prize card Minerva. And after that, uh, nothing, as far as if... Cards being less than Minerva's price, it's, I've made my peace with that. That's just how Yu-Gi-Oh! is. Yep. I am not buying bonfires because I'm not built like that right now. And I'm, I'm living the proxy life right now. So that's that's my verdict. Yeah, same. I think that it's ridiculous that these prices get this high. I get why they do. Uh, it, just, it just sucks. I do have one real wanted now. Still that's two true. other proxies, though. All right, next piece of drama. <laughs> um... <laughs> There's been drama around the competitive content debacle. Oh, yeah. So, ever since... So, I... Well, I think it started with MBT. Yeah, it started with MBT, and I found my way involved slightly, not really very much. That you get for reacting. So, basically, somebody... I made a video uh, on APS Amplifier just a couple weeks ago. That's this channel, yeah. That's this channel where you're watching this if you're on YouTube, at least. Subscribe, by the way. You're here. Do it. Um, So, like... There was somebody who commented on one of MBT's videos who was saying, like, I would love to see a two-hour-long, super-cut, like, deep guide on a given deck. Unchained or any other deck, let's say. Vanquish Souls. Yeah, like, I would love one on Vanquish Soul, let's say. Every single play scenario, every single, you know, possible combo, line of play, thought process, situation, breakdown, all of it, right? Mm Matchups. The whole nine yards. And MBT went on Twitter, and he was like, yeah, this would be pretty cool, although, like, you know, the YouTube structure and a lot of content creators aren't really incentivized to make that type of content because you won't really get very many views on a, like, two-hour-long piece of content like that, and it will get outdated very quickly because the meta's always moving, new products are always coming out, new stuff gets announced, and the video that you worked potentially months on, you know, compiling all your data, writing, scripting, you know, editing, all the visuals, whatever is now, like, out of date and will never get another view a day in its life because the meta's moved on or the that deck looks different. That could happen as little as, like, a week. Yeah, you never know. And um, so, it, you know, he explained it a little bit. Some people kind of were like, yeah, I guess you're right. Some other people disagree. They still think that there maybe should be more content like that. I made a video about it where I was just saying, like, yeah, I agree with MBT. It's kind of difficult for content creators to feel incentivized to make that sort of content, mm-hmm. but also that um, it's a shame that... Such a resource does not really exist for Yu-Gi-Oh! That is not meant to undercut the people who do make competitive content right now. There are people who make hand trap guides, combo guides, things like that. But just that it does feel like that's a more niche piece of content to make and they can sometimes feel unrewarding to make it if you're playing the YouTube game. You know who are my favorite competitive content creators? Hmm. It's MST.TV and Joshua Schmidt. Well, funny you mentioned Joshua Schmidt, actually, because he is the next participant in the story. Oh, my God. That's right. So the other day, he made a video uh, addressing the his take, at least, on the situation, mostly focused around MBT's video. Mine showed up at the end. Thanks, Josh. Um, <laughs> so he was basically saying that if there is a demand for that style of competitive content, you know, that nitty-gritty, like, stuff, then somebody should still make it. And I think he argued, by and large, that it's still worth it for a channel to try and that more people maybe, you know, should still do that just because um, you're a content creator doesn't mean that you should not, you know, attempt to make it if your audience is looking for it. Uh, so then that, so that happened, and then, like, I think Farfa got involved somewhere on Twitter. He said, You can like, always trust Farfa to slide yeah, yeah. in. <laughs> Farfa hopped in. Um, Jealous of Farfa. Good guy. Uh, he was like, yeah, you know, I agree with Josh, and um, 
like, you know, MBT saw that tweet. He quote tweets it, and he's like, all right, listen, we're starting a thread, and I'm going to explain what, what I meant by that. And he came with receipts, and basically MBT goes on to explain um, why competitive content in the Yu-Gi-Oh space is lacking and some of the shortcomings that we have with, like, covering this game. We as in just, I guess... The community. Just the community. There's not, like, a real archive of really valuable, up-to-date resources. And so he showed some examples of, like, you know different guides he was able to find on YouTube or deck profiles. Some were either super beginner friendly. Most were outdated. We have why pro deck. That's all we need. You yeah, know, on why pro the... deck, I saw an Exodia <laughs> list that didn't have the head of Exodia. Yeah. So that, so he kind of goes on and talks about that. And basically I saw it ended up on Reddit as well. People were talking about it and it's the reason why it's a bit of a controversy is because I think that there's a bit of a disconnect. Mm-hmm. Um, between maybe content creators and like and like viewers i suppose like Yu-Gi-Oh players because the players like, who want the competitive content yeah the people who want the competitive content because like we're all making Yu-Gi-Oh content and people come to Yu-Gi-Oh content kind of thinking like okay this is how i get better at the game or like i want you know these resources but then if you're a content creator you're not as incentivized to make that style of stuff because it's more narrowly appealing and you might be better off just making a master duel saga or a progression series or you know Whatever, a rare hunter, slacker, slackers. slackers. Watch that segment, by the way. Could use a few more views. Um, you know that sort of thing. Like, it's a it's a, a tug of war, like a push and pull. Right. All right. I'm done talking. What do you think? So I think uh, as far as Yu-Gi-Oh content goes on YouTube, you can break it down into like a few different categories. Mm-hmm. So as, given that Master Duel is a thing now, there's now Master Duel content. Yeah, that's um, that's like Sam stuff. That's a lot of Simo stuff. It, it's it's mass dual content. I won't. It's casual, but um, it's not casual like insert team APS casual content where it kind of leans towards like retro style, like physical cards. Yeah, kind of nostalgia. And, yeah, kind of nostalgia. Then there is the competitive content. We'll call it broad competitive content where it's more of like, you know. Lists of the best hand traps, some like g- more general ideas about um about the format, but but not specific decks. You have to like, actually take a microscope out. At that point, you bring out your microscope and you look at YouTube a little bit deeper, and then you start seeing the videos that are like specific looks at specific decks during the format. There are channels that specialize in that sort of thing, but they are significantly smaller than the rest. And the thing is, if you are in that space, your algorithm's full of them. So I think for like someone like Joshua Schmidt, he sees those creators all the time because he is in a more competitive space. He actually is more likely to see those creators than someone like me. I see a lot of the more general content. I see I see Sam's content. I see Simo's content. I, you know, a lot of like just kind of more general casual Yu-Gi-Oh content. And as a, as, a, as a content creator, you have to ask yourself which one of those slices of the Yu-Gi-Oh! pie or the Yu-Gi-Oh! niche, and I've got to make, make it very clear, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a niche on YouTube. There's only so many views to go around. Which one do you want to be? Yeah, you could love Infernity. You could be the Infernity god. And you could explain Infernity 3,000 different ways and make an entire series about that one deck. But... If you only pull in a hundred uh, or a few hundred viewers on each video, you will look. You can look at other people's channels who are doing more general content, more casual content, pulling in thousands more viewers. And it's like, well, maybe I want to be in one of those slices of the Yu-Gi-Oh niche instead of this one. Yeah, you know, we actually Team APS. We used to make more competitive content years ago. And, but even then, it was still more general competitive content. We talked about the a lot most of top fives, top tens. Yeah, we were a lot we were of deck a profiles. Lots, yeah, deck profiles. We talked about the best cards of the format. We talked. We would talk about cards some like meta like decks and set. stuff. Yeah, but that was back when I understood Yu Gi Oh. Now, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I would definitely say that you are you're pretty spot on. Like, there's just there's different sects of YouTube and. Um, I like the way you um, you pronounced that word, so it didn't sound like anything else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there are different uh, areas of YouTube where, you know, like, 
there are more or less views in different places. And the thing is, not everybody's on YouTube for viewership, right? Some people right. are on it to, to make a valuable resource, to make guides, to make coverage, to make breakdowns. And they're not concerned with, like, you know, getting, let's say, 100,000 subscribers on YouTube or getting X amount of average views or, you know, whatever. Maybe they're in it more for, like, passion and just, you know, the competitive aspects of the game. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I do think that you can see where, like, that content can be, like, it feels like it isn't maybe just rewarded. I mean, I feel like YouTube just kind of stamps you out slowly when you do that. Yeah, you'll, you'll have a consistent audience maybe, but it'll just be small and it could potentially dwindle. I think one of the points that MBT raised that was really good was that um, really video content's not even the best place for competitive stuff. Like there's some things that work really well in the video format, mm -hmm. but really like for a lot of guides, like in Magic the Gathering, that was, he like points to Magic as an example of a game that has far more competitive resources that are also far more updated. Uh, a lot of them will be like kind of these visual guides, like text-based guides that have like visual elements, but that way they're much easier to up like update because I mean I can't update a video once it's on YouTube you know what I mean right I can't really like go in and like update I have to like make a whole new one or something and that's its own kind of can of worms in terms of like how well that video might perform and how much effort that might be to make but you know you could always make an updated guide like in, in terms of like a blog or something mm -hmm. you can always update that and, and you can even change the name to let people know that it's updated and it can be like a living growing resource Whereas, um, like on YouTube, that's just a little bit harder. And that way you kind of wouldn't have to be fighting the whims of the algorithm and stuff like that. One of the things that I've also seen a lot of is sort of just related to the discussion is the sort of the death of the deck profile. I know right. we've talked about this a lot in our own little YouTube like brainstorming real time. sessions. Yeah, we, we did. I think we lived through it. There was a period of time where YouTube was really like 80 percent deck profiles it felt like it was so it was mostly just you just you profile decks that was it i mean like you there was a little bit of pike opening a little bit of like you know kind remember, of meta talk remember the swarm after like regionals and ycs's of people just with cameras trying yeah, to get, the, deck you get the first place deck profile and the thing is now like you know that style of content has sort of died off uh, on youtube because people will maybe get the profile there are channels that will get that video but it gets pretty immediately copied and like just formatted into like a picture by those like Yu-Gi-Oh News TCG or those other like Instagram and like accounts and stuff, Dual Daddies, right? Which that's actually the name of the account, not like a, a sugar it's daddy your, it's or something. Dual Daddy. I ain't but do um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's basically like so that content like isn't there's let its shelf life has like gone from short to virtually non-existent. Yeah. I mean, like, literally, somebody just has to get the list, and then, like, I would share that picture with my friends and my, like, shop's local, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! page. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, here's the, the Bistio Runic deck that won. Here's a screenshot of it. Why do I need to watch the profile when I, I mean, I've got that? So, I think when you look at it that way, you can really see where the problems maybe start to arise with, like, making that content as a means of like growth on youtube right but if you're not planning on growing then like sure you know make it all day long it's just that there's the factors at play are kind of working against you in a way if you do the uh and at the end, it's like you said at the very beginning of this kind of topic um it's the difference between um being a youtuber because you want to be a content creator and make a living and make money or being a YouTuber because you want to share and be a resource for your community. If you really want to just share and be a resource for the community, then it, it's easier to make that content and just make your peace with the fact that it's not gonna it's not gonna really grow and you're not gonna see huge dividends from the channel. But it feels that YouTube is so such a competitive space. The algorithm will, ju will will do its best not to even show your content to people. They have to search it, and you have to show up properly, and you don't have a whole lot of control in that. Yeah. Versus like text based guides that usually like if someone searches for a let's a unchained guide January twenty twenty four and you have an article posted on some blog about an unchained guide for January twenty twenty four, Google will usually find that. They'll drag it right up. Hey, yeah. this is the this is the one you want right here. Yeah. I, I was gonna say two. I mean I think like and it's unfortunate to say a lot of people really I think it needs to be said, though, is I think that there are people who 
aren't fully aware. Like when I read comments on the on that art, you know, the arguments and stuff that were happening on Twitter around this, and like Reddit, mm-hmm. there are some people who I think like aren't fully aware of how small competitive Yu Gi Oh truly is. Like in the big scheme of things, Yu Gi Oh is already a niche hobby, like right. a niche interest. And within Yu Gi Oh, there are so many different ways that a person might engage with it that are not just competitive. There are people who like just are anime fans and they just love drawing fan art. That's it. They just love yep. drawing and sharing fan art and shipping characters. And they do not stop having Bakura x Yami pictures. Come on, y'all, relax. Well, typically Bakura and Yami Merrick. Or not, actually, no, it's usually Bakura and Merrick, not Yami Merrick. Like, I, I, saw, I saw Bakura and the Pharaoh, and I wasn't I'm sure there's a little I wasn't, I saw too much of him. But, um, yeah, so, you know, there are people who, like, just love the artwork. There are people who cosplay, and there are people who, like, and, and oftentimes those groups of people don't give two hoots about the game. There are people who are still playing in 2014. Like, yeah. And I'm not saying time was a format. No, they built their decks in 2014 and they just never stopped playing them <laughs> that time. Yeah, there are people who are, you know, competitive. There are people who are casual. I think that what most people even consider to be casual today isn't actually even casual. Right. Like, there are competitive types who are playing, like, kind of top of the meta decks. They're at the YCSs. They're at the regionals. Clearly not casual. Doing the nitty-gritty. That's clearly not casual. But even what you might call casual in a typical kind of Twitter Reddit thread is still someone who's actually quite obsessed with Yu-Gi-Oh. They just maybe play lower tier decks and maybe on a bit more of a budget, but they're still like Yu-Gi-Oh-ing quite frequently. If you know when the last ban list was and the current like state of the list, you're not that casual. Yeah. I mean, I was going to (laughs) say, if you have a complaint about the game, you're not casual. Like, I'm saying that broadly, yeah, right? Yeah, it is a very But, like, sense. generally speaking, like, if, you know, if you, let's say, want, like, a certain floodgate to get banned, or you want Barone to get banned, or you want a hand trap or whatever to get banned, that means that you are probably more than just a casual Yu-Gi-Oh! player. You probably do play a fair bit. You might play what some would call, like, a more fun deck, or, like, a more budgety deck, but, like, you're still in it. I think the real casual players are the ones you don't hear anything about. Because they don't even know how to communicate about this game. Yeah, because they don't... The, the, the truly casual Yu-Gi-Oh! player, right, is somebody who doesn't know where, where to play the game, doesn't know about the ban list, doesn't really know... Like, Fallen of Alvaz? Visa Starfrost? What? Like, they, they don't know any of that. Like, And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just saying that... They like, just checked out from Yu-Gi-Oh! For most of those people, what's going to be more enticing? The two-hour-long, you know, guide on how to play Snake Eye in this format? Or Master Duel Masochist? Or Sly for Slackers? You know what I mean? Just something that's like, oh, they're playing, like, the GX decks. Like, I remember it. Oh, like, Roids and Heroes. Or, and, or, the, or a 10-hour compilation of Exodia obliterating. Yeah, or just, like, some Exodia. So, you know, like, oh, can this person pull off Exodia? It's like, OTK and Master Duel? Whoa! Like, and I'm not, I guess I'm making it sound like one's, like, bad or good or whatever, but I just do think that um, if you want to reach a lot of people, it's, it, you might be better off making more, like, broadly appealing mm-hmm. content, but then that, in that way, you're not serving the people who do want, you know, to get into the nitty-gritty and want their information. So, it's tricky. <sighs> but, oh, consensus thoughts? I mean, I feel that... There's a very large competitive audience in, in Yu-Gi-Oh, but I don't think a lot of competitive players really exist on the YouTube platform. Not really. Yeah, that's actually that's a good, that's a good point. I, I should have mentioned that too. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just um, I think I, I think I see more competitive players like as far as video content goes, they hang around Twitch more. A lot of uh, a lot of streamers like to um, yeah streaming like you know they stream more DB modern, ladder stuff and like test hands really nitty gritty type things. Then I feel like the some of the really best players aren't really looking to YouTube for content. I mean they're they're already pretty competent deck builders and they're already like like they don't really need. A Many deck of them have seen or, the uh, you know. like current YouTube channels and like those guys can't teach me anything. Yeah, and and they're fair. right. Honestly, fair. Right, like I mean, like I, I can't teach you how to be like good at Yu Gi Oh. We're making freaking content where we play with old structured decks, right? Like, and the same thing goes for an MBT, uh, if far for anybody, right? Like they're not making content that's like high meta. They're making just stuff that you can kind of enjoy if you just know about the game mm-hmm. in general right now. It's like, can we can we make or ha- do we make content 
that would interest, let's say, uh, you know, what Joshua Schmidt, Jack Joshua Schmidt, right? Like, like probably, probably not. not. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, and, and that's okay. It's just that there are these different lanes, and like, I guess everybody's kind of got to respect, like, like be honest with yourself. Like, what lane are you in? What do you expect to see? And once you've decided that, don't expect more out of people that clearly aren't there to provide it for you. Right. If that like makes sense. Don't look to content creators, look to your wallet and buy your bonfires. Cause it doesn't matter what level you're at. You're going to need those precisely. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's tricky conversation, but not as tricky as the next one, because we're still we're talking about Yu-Gi-Oh done. like an hour and 15 minutes into this podcast. Um, okay. The two player starter deck, Oh, jeez. Was revealed by content creators this week. They opened it and showed us what's inside, so now we have a full look at the product. You might remember... In Zeus previous, is in it. You might remember in previous episodes that we were withholding our judgment on the product until we saw the full thing. We saw it. Well, now that we've seen the full thing, people have thoughts. And I think what's important to bring up about these uh, two-player Star decks is there's actually two arguments to be had here. I think yeah. the biggest argument is, that most people are having is they're very disappointed in the contents of the product insofar as re- relevant staple reprints or like really modern cards in general. So, where to start with this? Well, first of all, I guess let's just first start with what the product is. Okay. So we can, you know... This is a two-player starter set. It is a $20, I believe, is the MSRP product that has two pre-made decks. And the idea is that these are supposed to help new players learn the rules of Yu-Gi-Oh! through a scripted duel. So it also comes with a sort of comic book-style pamphlet that walks you through the duel and explains the rules and stuff as you go... And the two decks, uh, one is based on Xyz Summoning, one is based on Synchro Summoning. And so they, the controversy kind of begins with the cards that are inside. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously a lot of vanillas in both decks. It seems way more than I expected. Yeah, I was kind of surprised by that. And some of them are quite old vanillas. There's like Ojamas in here. (laughs) Dark Magician. There's Elder Hero, Sparkman, and Dark Magician. But then also like just Spirit of the Harp and Gilgarth and... La Jin, the Mystical Genie of the Lamp, and Sword Stalker. So, um, certainly some vanillas. There's there's a lot, and that's like not, I was mentioning like maybe half of them. There are also kind of some seemingly random spells a little bit. Um, like you have your MST and your Book of Moon, that kind of dark hole, sort of Old light. staples. Kind of older staples. Um, a few really weirdly specific ones like Trade In or White Elephant's Gift for, I guess, draw power. Um, and some effect monsters. There's, like, Cyber Dragon, there's Dark Magician Girl, Crane Crane, Chiron the Mage, um, God God Magician, Penguin Soldier, Mask of Darkness, Quobalt Hedgehog. So, you know, some some effect monsters, mostly older ones. I see Card Trooper in here, Mobius the Frost Monarch. And there's a few traps, which also are largely old. There's stuff like Kunai with Chain, Magic Cylinder, Back to the Front, um, Call the Haunted, you know, Draining Shield. So... These are very, very rudimentary teaching tools. Oh, yeah. And I want to get the good, I guess, out of the way first. What I think these products do succeed at and what's good about them. Mm-hmm. What we think we, uh, what maybe we each like. Before we get into the bad, just so that people know, like, we're approaching this not from, like, a bad faith angle where it's just like, this sucks, it's terrible, and there's nothing to say about it. So when you saw these, I mean, like, what do you think? Do you think that there's anything that's... I mean, it has a mix of different types of Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Mm -hmm. And so if you were introducing someone to Yu-Gi-Oh, they would see a mix of, you know, effect monsters, vanilla monsters, flip effect monsters. You have your quick play spells, your continuous spells, your... Uh, I don't know. Were there any counter traps? I don't remember seeing any counter traps. Yeah, there's counter traps. Okay. So yeah, there's a good mix of Yu-Gi-Oh stuff. Where I haven't seen a scripted duel, so I don't know how useful it is. But if you if the scripted duel uses I all lied, those actually, cards, there's not any counter traps. Uh, never mind. Anyway, but if you use the if you follow the scripted duel and you use all those cards in that set, uh, a person will have certainly seen quite a bit of Yu-Gi-Oh there. Yeah, so um, I agree. I think that 
some people have maybe lost a little bit of sight of what this is intended to do. This is literally supposed to teach Yu-Gi-Oh! Mm-hmm. Like, just teach you the bare foundational rules of the game. And I think that it does that in a pretty... Seems like it's going to do that in a pretty good job because it covers, like, attack and defense changing, stuff that would flip monsters face down, you know, flip effect monsters. Quick, There's, like, quick effects, there's ignition effects, there's trigger effects... There's a little bit of everything. Um, there's cards like Night Beam where like your opponent cannot respond with said card. Um, there's like monsters that modulate their levels. There's just all kinds of things. And there's like graveyard effects or whatever effects that activate in the hand. So I think that they would do a good job of teaching you stuff. We also got to see the, um, the manga sort of comic thing. And um, it seems like it does start with vanilla monsters and, like, equip spells and just kind of attacking and stuff and slowly moves upwards towards, like, effect monsters. Ramps up. And then you eventually ramp up to, like, making the extra deck summons. So I think that the scripted duel thing is a cool way of doing that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else nice I have to say before I kind of rip it. I ran out of stuff. So, where would you start with your criticisms? It's ugly. Ugly, what do you mean? That it is a product of one offs with that one offs of disparate types, attributes, archetypes, generations. Yeah. Everything. It's it's not a good looking deck. And I understand you're trying to teach someone Yu Gi Oh, that's cool and fine and all, but there's nothing aesthetically pleasing about this. Yeah. It's like it's as if someone put their hand in a box of cars and just came and up just with a bunch of randoms. Yes. Yeah, so I know they were well thought out choices. I'm not saying they didn't pick the best cars they could. It's just it's, it's, it God, doesn't it, appear. It does not look It good. does not appear very visually. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because I actually want to first talk about the box itself, the product. Oh, okay. Now, this is me nitpicking. This is Paul's marketer kind of advertiser brain here. I think that they could have done a little bit of a better job with the packaging of the box. Mm-hmm. It does not, to me, uh, invoke a narrative. I, you know, I think what's really important for people, at least when I was a kid, and also even now when I see like card game stuff at, like on the shelf at like a Target, is the idea that like this is a two-player starter deck and it's a kind of a versus thing, me versus you, right? Like right. red versus blue, or. Dragons versus spellcasters, or aliens versus machines, or something. Kaiba versus Yugi. Kaiba versus Yugi, or just something like that. And there's none of that here. Now, I get that, like, Zeus and Manadium Primeheart, I guess, look like they could be rivals, so sure. But I think that the fact that the box isn't, I think that they could have been, like, a horizontal box, and, like, one side's got Zeus and all of these, like, cool machines, and then one side's got, like, you know, Primeheart. And these cool, like, aliens. Oh, like those Pokemon two-player starter things. A lot like the competing game's superior product. What? (laughs) Anyway, no, I. but you're right. I mean, I think that, like, something where it kind of, something for you to get into, something to kind of, like, you know, it's not just two-player starter set. It's, you know, like, I pick the fire deck and you pick the ice deck and, like, you know, there's something to kind of get behind. And I think that it's missing that. And that goes, I think, pretty well into your point, which is that these decks don't really have any theming. Um, I know that they are, none. they are meant to teach mechanics. And so I think in that way, they're probably very, um, you know, bespoke for that purpose. But, th- but here's my thing. I think you could have done that with some type of theme in mind. Yeah. I think one deck could have been a Spellcaster deck and one deck could have been a Warrior deck. Spellcasters and Warriors have been in this game for the entire run of Yu-Gi-Oh. You could have found cards. A, mo- a card of each, that- ty- of each like, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they all have attack and defense altering stuff. Stuff that You want to do hand. Synchro so bad, you have Infernobles. And if you want to do Xyz so bad, you can do um, Gaga or yeah. Dark Magician actually has Xyz monsters. So. I mean, I was going to say, like, there's just, there's so much thematically that feels like it's kind of lost on this product. Mm-hmm. And so that, I think, is a bit of a shame. Um, uh, yeah. I, I'm still thinking of more, like, Old Vindictive Witch could be as a good flip effect monster. Um, Exiled Force, a great um, on field, just, uh, it, it tributes itself as cost and. Yeah. Now, another thing, too, is that there are people who thought, you know, they're saying these products are trash because they don't really have any good reprints. I think for people who are saying that, I will say that you're probably missing the point of the product. Mm -hmm. Um, It is not, you know, like people are saying, oh, it's basically a Zeus reprint, and that's it. And that's the only reason you would buy this. The thing is, this isn't for competitive Yeah, it's the only reason you would buy it. 
Like this isn't this is not a product that is for competitive players. This is a product that is for the newest of the new players. You are trying to like learn the foundations. So it's not meant to have like, you know, hand trap reprints and a bunch of imperms and get your SP Little Knight and your triple tactics thrust and your Axis Code Talker all inside of your little like ten, twenty dollars. Well, I do think you know, those deck. cards would be useful for a new player just to get in there. Something kind of deal with anyway. We're getting into that in a second. Oh, okay. But no no, no I mean yeah, yeah. You go ahead if you want. I'm, I'm just saying, saying like, that. I'll get into that in a second because I have thoughts about, like, what's being taught here. But I do think that I did not expect any, like, high-dollar reprints or anything like that for this product. In fact, if anything, you have to be kind of careful with that sort of thing. Because if you put too many, like, good reprints in it, then competitive players are just going to come and, like, Buy snatch these off the shelves. And then little Jimmy, who it's actually intended for, won't be able to get it. So I mean, they're just going to go back home and play Fortnite, so. That's true. That's true. Um, okay. Next thing is that these are not really representing Yu-Gi-Oh. What the, the way that they are presenting this game and the things they're teaching are the foundational rules. So that, I think, is effective. But what they're not showing you is an accurate look at what you'll face, even just at locals today. They didn't even put evenly matched in here. Like, you haven't played Yu-Gi-Oh until someone's in, like, end of battle phase, evenly matched. So I think that um, that's kind of an important that's probably the biggest problem that I think people have with this is just that this is a bit of a deceptive product. It's effective for teaching you the rules, but it's not effective for kind of showing you what you can expect mm. against anybody. And you know, we were just saying how like, uh, you know, what some like people like to call casual Yu-Gi-Oh players are still pretty like grubby Yu-Gi-Oh players. Even if you none. go to locals and play against somebody playing a tier four deck, it's still going to run circles around you. I mean, like, if you think of just any archetype nowadays that you might play, even the worst archetypes still have pretty long turns and still have pretty involved, like, Not you know, Malice Everest. And stuff. <sighs> Poor Malice Everest. Yeah, but, um, I mean, it's true, though, right? Like, yeah. I, I think, um, I think that's kind of where these products maybe feel like they're lacking. And if they're a starter set, somebody said maybe they could make, like, an intermediate set. Right, like mm -hmm. something that better says, um, okay, you've learned the basics. Now here's something that's a little bit more advanced, but closer to what you might see. I do think what's what's interesting about this set is I don't even if you play through the, whatever. I haven't seen the uh, the duel that you play. Mm -hmm. even if you play through it and learn all the basics of Yu Gi Oh, I can't drop a crystal B structure in your hand and be like, all right, now you're ready. Yeah, a big issue comes also from the fact that most archetypes in Yu-Gi-Oh are fairly self-contained. So no matter what you learn Yu-Gi-Oh with, the first archetype you play will probably break some rules, have its own unique gimmicks that but don't really... Isn't this know. zone only for spells and traps? Well, it's for monsters that can be treated as spell and traps too. Don't worry, the card will tell you if it can be put back there. Yeah, I mean, oh, but they don't have their monster effects anymore now. So I mean, I was going to actually say it gets more just per archetype than that. I mean, yeah. there are some pendulum decks that work like like pendulum monsters will say, and then some that don't. Like some use the pendulum mechanic not as pendulums. Valens do that. Like super heavy samurai use pendulums just really to skip the fact that, you know, <laughs> like the, the spell trap thing. There's, you know, Valmonica. Yep. Like all these decks that just kind of like skip around stuff. Xyz summons get like skipped by uh, Zodiacs, right? Tri-Brigade skips hey, the They link. got Zeus. So they know that they can cheat Xyz summons. Yeah, and like also like, you know, Tri-Brigade... They kind of cheat out Link monsters, and there's so many different things like that. Um, yeah, the Star Deck should have had more mechanic cheating stuff in it. Yeah, to get you a more accurate look at how this game's like, played. Like, all right, so on your first turn, you draw. Wait, your opponent chains their effect. What? But it's the first turn. No, but that in Yu-Gi-Oh, sometimes your opponent has effects yeah. that can activate they when use you their draw tier, a card. Tier elements monster so. that summons and starts milling in your turn and sets off their combos. I was going to say, too, I mean, I'm kind of surprised that they left out Link summoning, at least, and, like, Fusion. Because I get maybe leaving out Pendulum, I suppose. It's a bit off-putting, and, like, you have to really, like, work the deck around the Pendulum mechanic. It can be tough. But I am surprised, like, Link monsters aren't in here. Especially since, at one point, they were like, Link monsters are the only way to play Yu-Gi-Oh! Well, that and Master the fact Rule that, like, four. Link is part of the off-putting part of Yu-Gi-Oh! So you would think that that should be tackled in here. So that people go into this product, like, or rather, come out of this experience, not afraid of Link monsters. Because, you know, like, what so many people say is, like, 
Oh, I stopped playing Yu-Gi-Oh! when Links came out. Yeah. They were too confusing. They can't go into defense mode. Links and Pendulum's are number one. Arrows, link ratings, no defense points, no levels, and, you know, co-link, pointing to, linked, you link. I hated all those, like, link ex- exclusive terms. Yeah, and all that stuff. And so, because they're off-putting, I think that addressing them in a deck like this might have been a good idea. And I'm not saying, again, like, it would have been nice to have an access code talker and ask me Little Knight. But, I mean, even if not that, Nightmare Phoenix, Nightmare Cerberus, Nightmare Unicorn. The basics. You know what I mean? Like the staples. Just, just easy link monsters that just kind of show, like, hey, you can make this link monster and pop a card. And if it's co-linked, then you get to draw a card. So, you know, it's... I think that would have really um, brought down the barrier to entry with the Link Monster sort of problem that some people cite with Yu-Gi-Oh. So, um, and I guess we're just assuming everyone knows what a fusion is. I mean, we're just like, hey, yeah, look, I guess they're assuming slap that. down this polymerization and make things happen. Although, like, even th- with that, like today's fusion summons tend to be a super little poly. Bit- well, no, I was going to say just they tend to be, like, I'm thinking of cards like on Neos Fusion, Fusion Destiny, Brandon Oh, we've used out the deck, yeah. Yeah, where, like, stuff sends from deck or, like, kind of, you know, spells, traps. Monsters can, like, use their effects to Fusion Summon, so. Yeah. Um, Gotta put an Albaz in there. Let them know. Any other thoughts on it? On this product, uh, it's too expensive for what it is. Um, $20, you think 20 bucks for is this too much? is too much. I think the I think twenty dollars would have been okay if it had been closer to what we were describing earlier, mm-hmm. where there's a little bit more of a theming. Because here's one small like thing why I think the twenty bucks is a bit much. These cards in a vacuum are largely worthless. Yeah, These are most just kind of, of them completely useless. You know, commons that most players won't use. That isn't to say that they are useless, but the next problem that I was going to say is that. These decks are meant to be played in the scripted duel. Mm-hmm. It's a finely scripted duel. There's not much reason to do it more than, like, But twice. the thing is, yeah, once you've done that duel once or twice, these decks cannot just be shuffled up and played with. Like, they can, and it's like you can literally do it. But they, they are not in any way cohesive strategies, and so you won't really have, like, a lot of fun doing that, I would assume. I think that if they had made decks that were a little bit more cohesive, then $20 feels more fair because there's replay value in it. I think that paying $20 for a tutorial that you can only really play as a scripted tutorial... I don't know. Like most of the cars don't even have a place in your collection. Yeah, so they just don't. Um, I don't know. I I, I find that. How much not. are you willing to pay for this product? I think I I would say like fifteen bucks would probably be fair. I was thinking ten. You're a better man than me. Ten, yeah, ten ten's really probably what you should be paying for this. But maybe they're assuming that people will split the cost. Like it's like, oh, me and my friend, and we're like at we'll Walmart. We'll each spend ten dollars on this waste of money. Each spend ten dollars. You know what it reminds me of, Paul? You know what it reminds me of? Mm-hmm. I know we talked about it before. The uh, Pokemon um, beginner, like, how to play deck product product they put out a few months ago. I forgot what it's called, but I saw it on store shelves. Nope, I got hiccups. My First Battle. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, I remember that. You know what I liked about My First Battle? Is the packaging looked like it was, like... My first battle. I had these little, little like, uh, first form starter Pokemon on it. And uh, it sold exactly what you would have expected. It sold a narrative, which there's a story. There's, like, there's some love and passion there. This doesn't have this, that. This has a Gundam on it. Which, that's the thing. The Gundam being on it isn't the problem. It's just that, like, it isn't it, there, uh, there's no story. It's like, there's no, none of them again are friendly about Gundam. Well, no, I think that I could have What gotten... series did you start from? Wait, what do you mean? Nothing. Well, but, like, what I mean is it's, like, I think that the Gundam thing could have worked. It's just, like, give it, like, again, like, plants versus something, dragons versus spellcasters. You know, give us some some kind of a theming. It's not a secret that Yu-Gi-Oh! is a more, like, kind of high fantasy setting than, say, Pokemon is. Right. So I don't think that, like, you need to necessarily have, like, cute little starter Pokemon-like figures... But I do think that having, okay, wizards against dragons or knights against wizards or knights against dragons or something like that. Or plants versus zombies. Could really be cool. Or if you want to kind of go the, like, machine route, right? Like, you know, people versus machines or something. But there's not really any of that here. And the monsters that are just randomly in these decks are completely disparate cards. Like, there's just no synergy here. And I think that on a shelf, when I look at how the product looks, I just... 
I don't know that it says anything. I don't know that the product is really like. It's not pulling me in. Towards me either. So people are uh, obviously not very happy about this. Uh, a lot of people think this product sucks. I don't think it sucks. I think it probably teaches you the rules and uh, succeeds at that. But I think that it might be hampered from even getting its way off the shelf. Will you be picking it up? Well, of course I will for a video. No, okay. But no, I would. I, don't, I think that it's not for you know your average like Yu-Gi-Oh player. If you know what the current ban list is, this isn't for you. Yeah, so. Um, would you pick this up for, like, friends? Yeah, I'm actually going to have one sealed copy of this on me. Okay. Uh, and I'll just wait until I have an opportunity to use it. Like, what would you use it for? To, like, reintroduce a friend to Yu-Gi-Oh! Or um, show someone Yu-Gi-Oh! for the first time. I have a younger brother who's never played, so that's probably where I'd use it. Do you think that this is better or worse than these Speed Duel products? Speed Duel? The speed like, duel, oh, like the, box the boxes, products. yeah, like uh, for Streets like of introducing City. someone to Yu-Gi-Oh. Mm -hmm. I think the speed duel products are better for someone who has played Yu-Gi-Oh before, and you're reintroducing them to it now, especially if they played back in the DMGX era. I think this product is better if they've never touched a Yu-Gi-Oh card a day in their life, mm -hmm. because it it doesn't expect anything of you. There are no there are no mechanics to really wrap your brain around. I think it's solid for that. Yeah, I saw some people mentioning that it feels like the Speed Duel products actually do a better job of, like, the teaching than even, than, like, this does. I think that they probably do in a way. I mean, they, they, they're they better themed. Like, the Rex versus Weevil kind of, like, Ultimate Predators, like, thing in Speed Duels. You know, that was a while two, ago. It was, but, like, do you remember that product? Uh, vaguely. Yeah, I think that was a better product than this because it had two characters mm -hmm. and it had two themes. Dinos and, and bugs. Yeah, and so like there was something to kind of get into, whereas this, I just, I don't know that it's got that. So overall, I mean, you know, we'll pick it up. We'll do a video. Any closing thoughts on it? I think I gave them. Just nothing else? Okay. Well, hopefully people can just kind of look past this. I think if you're like a devout player, just pretend this product didn't exist, right? I mean, did it have a choice? It's not for you. Like, there's not really much else to say about it. I hope that if they maybe... You know, in the future, if they were to make, like, a sequel to this, maybe they can add some more of that, like, theming part to it. I, I just hope it sells. I, I would hate to see this just sitting on shelves forever. Do you think it'll sell? I don't know. I saw a lot. Uh, that Pokemon My First Battle product sits on shelves, and I think that was a better marketed product, so. Yeah. I wonder how the, when you say sits on shelves, where? At car shops. Like, I, I see them sitting like, there all the time, and like, oh, those aren't moving. So that's an interesting thing, actually. Um, this is more of a general conversation than just about the two-player starter set. I think it makes more sense that it would sit on the shelf at a card shop. What I'd be more interested in finding out is, I wonder if it sits at shelves at, like, Walmart and Target. Oh. Just because, like, if you're in a card shop, do you need to buy My First Battle? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah, that's true. And so the same might apply to this product where, like, within your card shop, it will collect dust because anybody who's setting foot in a card shop knows what, you know, they know why they're there, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, this might be a better buy uh, at, like, a Walmart or a Target or something like that. I don't know if that's the case. I So do you think, like, at a Walmart or a Target that this would sell versus maybe whatever it's competing against? I don't know. They have the got some new like Fortnite toys up nowadays. So, <laughs> and I saw Roblox and Minecraft. So I don't know. It's going to be a tough sell with them. these kids, man. We'll see. I mean, maybe people will be like you and they'll get it with the intention of like teaching, you know, a spouse, a younger family member, That's my goal. something like that. So that it would still get the purchase from you, even if it's not intended to be used by you. And I'm going to so. keep the Zeus. Yeah, just keep that. Okay. That's all the Yu-Gi-Oh. There's a couple of quick miscellaneous things. Some cards have been Some revealed and stuff. Um, have you seen any of the new card reveals? I don't remember. Yeah, I know there was a new Illusion Monster. Um, oh, yeah, the one from Dark Duel Stories. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that was a thing. Um, any others? There's a new... So, you know how they made the Dark Magician uh, Monster Reborn card? Yes. They're making a Blue Eyes Soul Exchange one as well. Really? How was Soul Exchange used in the? Uh, yeah. The so the so I don't know if we talked about the Dark Magician one in the podcast. Did we, we did. We did. We did. Okay. The quick play. The, the quick play monster reborn. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, the effect is still obscure. Now it's like you know they show it in the V Jump magazine oh, okay. or whatever. It's one of those. We don't okay. get to know what the effect is, but it's got like blue eyes on it, and so like the 
name translates to um you know like activate spell soul exchange. Do you remember the episode it was from? Uh, so it's weird that it has blue eyes on it. I think that Kaiba used that in the duel against the rare hunters in like the tag duel is where he uses soul exchange for mm-hmm. that. Because the only other time he uses soul exchange, I want to say is against a Shizu, but that's the summon obelisk. So. Mm. Uh, I'm kind of interested in that. I just like these little anime callback cards. They seem neat. Yeah, Konami never runs out of ideas for printing cards, I swear. Yeah, and we've just been getting more of these um, illusion monsters as well, so I think that that's pretty neat. But I think that's all for Yu-Gi-Oh, or at least all of the major news. We've spent so much time on it. Have? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we spent a lot. Okay, uh, cool. So any other stories? Any actual stuff? We can maybe zip through a few. So I did want to talk. I don't know this might not be zippy. That's okay. <laughs> you know, <We're> here. <laughs> I did want to talk about the latest MCU series, Echo. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! I got yeah. to watch that. So yeah, we watched that this past weekend, mm-hmm. and uh, we have some thoughts. We have some thoughts. Yeah, I was curious. What do you? So Echo, the new Marvel show, um, it's on Disney Plus. It's actually you can binge it. They're not doing a weekly release. They just released all, all episodes the episodes released at the same time. At once, um, kind of evokes the old Marvel Netflix shows like Daredevil. Um, and seemingly they want to invoke that more now than ever. So hit me. What'd you think of the show? I thought uh, I thought Echo was all right. I uh, I enjoyed it. Um, I can honestly say I haven't up until the last episode, which I feel was a little rushed. I felt I never felt more interested in a Disney Plus Marvel show since maybe Wandavision. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It felt. I don't know, it it, just, it had that Marvel that that Netflixy feel that I really enjoyed out of the first season of Daredevil. Mm-hmm. Just very ground level combat with a character driven story. There's no huge like world, the world. At stake kind of plot line here. It's like no, this is one person in this one community, and they're besieged by the baddest man in Marvel comics. And no, we're not talking about Thanos. We're talking about Wilson Fisk. Yeah, so what I liked about this show, too, is all of what you said, and uh, it's the first of what they're calling the Marvel Spotlight series. Mm -hmm. So they're supposed to be kind of these more isolated stories. They're more character-driven, and they basically exist within the MCU timeline and all that, but that they, you don't have to kind of do the required reading. You just defined Moon Knight. Feels like, yeah, that's what Moon Knight was. (laughs) Yeah, you don't have to really do, like, kind of that required reading. Some people have actually described watching Marvel shows as homework. Because, yeah. effectively, that's what you have to do to kind of prepare yourself for the next theatrical release. Did you watch WandaVision? You might not know what's going on in Doctor Strange. Did you watch so-and-so? Oh, you might not know what's... You know, so, it's kind of like that. And I think, um, for me, as somebody who's more of a somewhat casual Marvel fan, obviously maybe more of one nowadays... Uh, well, if you um, follow if you follow the the hirings and firings, you can't really be considered casual anymore. Yeah, I'm not casual anymore. But yeah, I mean, I guess someone who's gotten into it maybe only recently, and I just haven't seen a lot of those earlier movies. I really um, I like the idea of like this Marvel spotlight stuff. I don't want to have to know every because I didn't watch like Hawkeye, which apparently she's a character from Hawkeye, but I didn't feel like I was missing out in any way, um, mm-hmm. having not watched it. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, Obviously, I'm not going to like really get into spoilers, so what I will say is I think that the character is very, they feel, I mean, I don't know. I, I liked the character. Um, uh, Maya? Maya, yeah. She never really went by Echo, I guess. It was no, more of like the, they, the, kind of the power It was almost has. like in true, um, like, net, that Marvel Netflix style. They never go by their hero names in that universe. Yeah. In um, that series. Yeah. But yeah, so I liked um I liked Maya. I found Except she for was, Iron Fist. I mean Daredevil kind of goes by his name too. I mean he kinda does. Devil of Hell's Kitchen. Or yeah. Whatever. Um but yeah, I found Maya was a very fun character. I like that she's kind of I mean, I don't know if I'd call her like an anti hero or just she's I, something. I think she's working her way to being an anti hero. I mean, honestly, she was a straight villain. Yeah. <laughs> like for a lot of it. Yeah. So, you know, she's she, she's got some work to do. She's rough around the edges. But I found that that was pretty fun. Uh, really unique like setting. Something that's not in New York, but also not like... Over in Oklahoma. Not in outer space or whatever. Um, getting some Native American like representation in a show is always reassuring. 
And I mean, all in all, oh, combat good. Like she's a badass. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, I, really I, good fight scenes. Yeah, really good fight scenes. Um, great fight choreography. Uh, it's one of those ones where I would say it's like it's a good watch. Yeah, I don't think I've had uh, shows where I left. I was left feeling like I wasted my time looking at you, Secret Invasion. Oh lord! But um, started watching Echo. I would just fine with it. Um, I feel like they. I feel like there was like an episode left on the table. That's because the last episode to me did feel a little rushed as far as getting to its ending. But literally up until that point, I was just locked in. I was just every episode. I was like, yeah, what's happening next? What am I going to do next? Oh, they going to kill who now? I I was really enjoying it. Well, they did change Echo's powers. I won't go into specifics of it, but um, Echo wasn't in the comics is not known for having like, actual like meta abilities more echo was more like a daredevil type hero where their power was you could look at it as being extremely talented yeah i mean i guess daredevil is like the superhuman hearing kind of thing yeah but it's not like a superpower it's like he's just extremely talented sure well i also like the cast it was very small cast of characters really not very many Mm. but pretty intimate but that's all to say there's one big important question. Was it made or not? What does this mean for LeBron's legacy? Oh man, I don't know. If, I don't know if you can come back from this. To be honest, more specifically, <laughs> what does this mean for like you know the MCU? Kind of like uh, as it goes forward. Like, does this like reassure hope in a time where a lot of people are fatigued out of these superheroes and they all hate everything that Marvel makes? I think it does, and it doesn't. Okay. I think it does because I was a big fan of the Marvel Netflix series. And so seeing them go back to a form, like moving in the direction of the formula that I enjoyed, uh, that makes me very happy because I have been, for the most part, disappointed in the uh, Disney Plus Marvel TV shows. Right. But at the same time, you can look at this as a backpedal. Um, they have seen the writing on the walls as far as how the MCU is performing and how it's being perceived by the audience. And they're like, oh, okay, what works, what works, what works? Oh, wait, you know what? Now that I look at it, people really did like that Daredevil show. Maybe. You know what's interesting about that? Hmm. So, like, when Echo came out, that's when they made the confirmation that, oh, yeah, the Netflix Marvel shows are canon. Yeah. They kind of, like, just back on that. Threw like, them like, onto like the Disney Plus timeline yeah, wheel. Just yeah. throw them and on so there. So it's kind of like, well, hmm. But I do think that if that's what it takes to get shows like this, I can't complain too much. Like, I liked Echo so much more than I've liked a lot of these Disney Plus shows. I mean, Secret Invasion like had me thinking, I, I don't know how much more I want to watch of these shows. <laughs> I mean, like it just really was not great. And it just, it, I feel like it mischaracterized a lot of people. It felt really rushed and jumpy. The ending was not at all But satisfying. it had super strength flying and all those other weird powers. Yeah, very shoehorned in. Like, and so I just, I really didn't like that. And I've been like mostly mixed with some of the other shows, but it's just, I think that between all of that and like the movies not, you know, sometimes not feeling super satisfying for a lot of people. I think Marvel knew something had to give. And mm-hmm. if this is the direction they choose to correct it, I would rather this than what we've heard from like certain interviews and stuff where it's like, we'll bring back, you know, Iron Man from the dead. If it's, if that's what it takes to get people back to theaters. Right. And we'll, and we'll just bl- call it another, a different timeline or dimension or, you know what I mean? Like multiverse. multiverse which was so weird. The multiverse is supposed to be the savior for the MCU, but now it's starting to look like it's the problem. Yeah, I mean, it feels like it's dragging it down and everything kind of just gets explained away with the multiverse. Or or the multiverse is a reason why you should have watched all five of these other shows before you get into the movie theater for this thing. What I liked about this show, Echo, is there was not a single mention of the multiverse. Nope. Not even an allusion to it, unless I missed some Easter egg. And mm-hmm, so, probably. you know, I think in that way... Good. Like, I, I, I like that it feels like this exists on its own merits, and the story is very much, you know, Maya's story, not how Maya might become an Avenger one day, and she might they might need her oh help. Boy, she got a long way before that. So, yeah, she's got some fixing to do first. But I liked it. I think, like, if you had to give it something out of 10, I know, I know like, numerical ratings are kind of luck, but if you yeah. had to. 
I know that um, I technically like this more than She-Hulk, only because the, the ending was better. At least to me, as some of y'all like that, I didn't. Um, yeah, I didn't love the She-Hulk ending. Liked it. I will that, go though. ahead and land it at an seven and a half to an eight. If okay. I can give half, it's a seven and a half. Yeah. If I can't, I'm giving it an eight. Okay. Because that's to me, that's right around where I I dropped Luke Cage, and I felt like just as entertained with this as I did with Luke Cage. So. Yeah, I would give this like a like an eight, seven and a half, and eight. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. Um, I mean, as it compares to the other Marvel Netflix shows, I think everybody kind of knows like Daredevil's kind of the top tier thing. Yeah, right? Daredevil is like a ten. The season one Daredevil is yeah. a ten to me. Yeah, season one Daredevil was great. I mean, all three seasons very good, really. I feel like it was a. I feel like season two onward has to be at like an eight and a half to a nine. Um, I mean, I think Jessica Jones in general is like my second favorite. Jessica Jones for me was another ten. Season yeah. one, season one, amazing. Other two seasons maybe more middling. I, but I, I not, but not bad by like any means. Eight, eight or seven. Um, I would say yeah. This probably ties with Luke Cage or so. Like I enjoy, I enjoyed it. So. Yeah, there are parts of Luke Cage I really really liked, and then parts that like were a little bit goofy. Like, but Iron Fist drops down to like yeah, like a I seven guess. ish. Uh, but maybe what I will six. But here's what I'll say about Iron Fist, and this is so sad. I was telling you this the other day. After, like, watching stuff like Secret Invasion, it made me actually think Iron Fist was not that bad. I mean, like, and I know Iron Fist, like, season one in particular was not the best. It, it was it, not. It, it was not the best. But, like, listen, I mean, it was at Secret least, Invasion like... Secret Invasion scored a three for me, so... Like, I mean, Iron Fist was at least, like, telling a story. You know right. what I mean? Like, something was going on. I feel like Secret Invasion was just, like... Th- this was just... I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would like to see... Maybe what can happen with Maya as a character. But also, if nothing else happens with her, I'd be okay with that. Right. Like, I think that her story reaches a pretty conclusive end, but, like... It, I have know, a whatever. feeling that she'll show up in the uh, Born Again Daredevil series just because in the comics mm-hmm. she worked with Daredevil some. And that so, wouldn't be a problem for me. I don't think I don't think she'd get, like, a huge role. Mm-hmm. But I think, she, I think she'll show up. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that sort of thing, so... Sounds like it's like a, a positive Marvel Netflix news. Yeah, I was, or, I was or Marvel happy. Yeah, Disney Plus Netflix, Netflix like show. We'll news. call it Marvel Spotlight. Marvel Spotlight news. That's yeah. Okay. Um. Well, I've got a quickie story. So, uh, a couple of card game things. Oh. Ravensburger reveals massive plans for Disney Larkana in 2024. You know These it's Raven, right? Just Ravensburger. My B. I'm just saying. Sometimes people get so upset with how I pronounce <laughs> card names on here. You wouldn't believe. Somebody told me like they like like had an aneurysm over how I said TR elements. How wait, isn't it TR elements? It is TR elements, and no one's gonna believe me. But if you just look up the translation of the freaking word, that's what it is. It's like tiara. Like that's what they're based on. It's TR elements. And lament. anyway, yeah, and lament. So. Uh, Disney Lorcana enters 2024 on a successful path, having launched in August 2023. Um, at the time, Ravensburger said it had plans for competitions, new sets throughout the calendar year, and further support for the card game. Well, they just announced in a new press release that its plans include Gateway, which is a new standalone Disney Lorcana product, plus Disney Lorcana TCG Challenge, which is its competitive circuit. Oh. There's also going to be in-store set championships, and on shelf dates for the four sets that will be released in 2024. Okay. So, the first item in the announcement is uh, TCG Gateway, uh, which allows newcomers to learn the basics, rules, and strategies. It's a progressive learn to play that serves as the ultimate beginner's introduction. It's a box set. So, um, this feels familiar. Yeah, like our two player starter. The box set includes everything needed to play Lorcana two 30 card basic Disney Lorcana TCG decks. A two-player game board with classic Disney character standees, player's guide, and additional cards. It works as a robust tutorial teaching players as they play through the instructions. By the end, they'll have two complete Lorcana decks and a grasp of how to play with each card type. It's going to be released on August 9th, actually, so a Oof. ways away. It's going to retail for $24.99, oh, that's more which I think expensive. is more than this uh, Yu-Gi-Oh deck. I'd love to see a picture of the product, but they don't really seem to show that. I'm wondering, because it, it being Disney, I feel like they're definitely going to have, like, two characters. It'll, pro- kinda, it'll probably look pretty nice. I, I, I don't doubt that. So, anywho, while Gateway welcomes new players, established fans of Lorcana also have something to look forward to in competitive and organized play events. You might remember that Lorcana launched, but did not have competitive play 
at release. Now it does. The Disney Larkana Challenge is an official competitive circuit in North America and Europe starting in May 2024. Um, they explain the tournament tiers as such. The events will begin at a regional level where players can compete to qualify for North American and European championships, respectively, with the top players earning invites to the World Championships slated for early 2025. The top four players from each event will qualify for the North American or European Championship in their respective region. Further details, such as schedules, prizes, registration, rules, and other info, will be shared on the official Disney Lorcana TCG That's site. That's pretty standard. In March. So yeah, kind of your, your average thing. They did not have this before. Nope. I think it was kind of interesting. Maybe a good call not to like start competitive play right out the gate. Let everybody kind of. I mean, it felt like Lorcana did just fine without it. I mean, I know people want it, and uh, but they still play, they still collect it, and now here's the circuit. They're also focusing on setting up local tournaments with a new type of in-store organized play event called Set Championships. Might okay. be familiar to you. You play Digimon. They do well, the same. It's like a store championship, yeah. It'll begin in April 2024. The company explains select Disney Lorcana TCG organized play approved. Such a long... Approved locations may host an Into the Inklands Championship. Oh, yeah, the new set. Which includes a unique... Enchanted Stitch, Rockstar, promo card. He's got a little guitar. Um, it's only available as a prize at, at the Into the Inklands Championships. The top two players at the event can also win a playmat featuring the new Stitch, Rockstar art. You know, Details I'm looking forward to that set. Released in February. Oh, why are you looking forward to it? Something you because, like? Because uh, it has cards from Treasure Planet, which is my favorite uh, Disney movie. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, you did say that. Mm -hmm. All right, here's the four sets that are going to be released in 2024, along with the dates, or at least the rough dates, that they will be released. So, Into the Inklands releases on February 23rd. Let's go. And um, also, okay, February 23rd at local game stores and Disney Parks. March 8th at Mass Retail and Shop Disney. Interesting. And Disney Parks. That's interesting. Yeah, so you guys might have remembered, maybe we've talked about this, but uh, Lorcana, it ships to game stores first, which is supposed to be sort of like a sign of goodwill by Ravensburger. They're like, hey, we care about card shops. We're not just going to release this everywhere. The card shops get it first so they can kind of cater to their audience and kind of get those initial sales. And then it goes to retail shops, like, you know, about two weeks later. Right. Now, the Disney Parks thing is you can buy these cards if you're like at, at Disney World or Disneyland or whatever. That's crazy. It makes sense. I just I hadn't thought about that. No one else can really flex that. Yeah, it makes perfect sense in a way. You go to Disneyland and you also get into their card game. Yeah. And it's per it's a really perfect, like, onboarding tool for, like, the youngsters, mm -hmm. right? I wonder if they hold tournaments or if they will. That would be cool. I'm supposed to take my mom to Orlando this December, so maybe. Uh, and maybe. May 2024 is to be announced. Oh, okay. Is the name of the set. And August 24 is to be announced. And also November 2024 is to be announced. So we have dates, just no products. We have products. dates, but no products. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. That makes some sense, I guess. And, of course, because this is an article from Comic Book Resources, our last paragraph Gotta is CBR. Disney Lorcana is a collectible strategy trading card game from Ravensburger. You Raven's stop reading Burger that right Disney. now. The game features character settings you. and items from franchises throughout the over 100-year history of Disney. You because have, you got to get that SEO in there. You have ruined every bit of goodwill you have built up. Listen, blame Comic Book Resources, not me. I do. You keep bringing them here. All right, any other stories? I got nothing. Well, I got one last one. Fan Where's it from? Wargamer.com. Okay. Fan mocks MTG's AI art advert with better human-drawn version. <laughs> so, a Magic the Gathering player has taken the AI art advert that caused outrage among fans last week, we talked about it on this podcast, um, and made their own human version on Blender. Their aim was to poke fun at the situation and demonstrate that man-made art is still better than AI. Because, you know, we had to get a little bit of AI in this podcast every now and again. At least this isn't like a huge story. Once a week. So, yeah, as you guys know, they released that advertisement and that AI art. People called them out. They said, no, it's not AI, guys. Then they later said, oh, okay, you guys are right. It's AI. Good, Sorry. Good job, guys. Good job, guys. Thanks for finding out. Well, um, yeah, Reddit user Crunch Sand has created their own version of the image using the computer graphic software, trying to get as close as possible to the original while sorting out a lot of the weird nonsense, in their words. Um, they say it required taking a lot of liberties to make sense of things. But the new picture sorts out the Uncanny Valley effect that tipped fans off to the original's AI origins. So, yeah. Uh, they have this, like, kind of this new Let version. See. I'll put it up on screen if I can. There's it at the top. I c yeah, I could tell. Yeah. I could tell. It already looks more natural. The window actually connects. Oh, look. Does it actually use the shock lens? I 
think it does. That'd be pretty funny. They even got like the right cards. So um, this guy says, or the artist says, I mainly did it for humor. That picture and AI art in general became known for skimping on effort. So I thought it'd be funny if someone recreated it with the actual human effort one would expect of it. It's something I had thought of before, but that adds controversy. It was the perfect opportunity for it. So, oh, Crunch Sand's image changes the cards on display, too. Instead of the MTG lands you can find in Ravnica Remastered, they've swapped in, um... <laughs> they swapped in some AI-themed cards, most of them featuring magic robotic villains, the Phyrexians. So oh, it's that's like kind funny. of a joke. That's funny. Um, I also did it out of a sense of needing to demonstrate that I'm better than an AI. That at least for the time being, I can bring to the table something that cannot be automated. So that's Crunch Sand. Also, let's face it, it's fun to try to make sense of the garbled nonsense AI often comes up with. So, yeah. I thought that was kind of a cool little uh, box topper to the controversy from last week. And the week before, technically. Now, now the question is, how much would they have uh, charged Wizards for that image? I guess more than the AI uh, would Because I charged. think that would be Wizards point of view. Like, hey, they were charging this much. Like... It is what it is. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really cool. It's it's a nice. It's always nice to see like fans kind of correct for this sort of thing, and uh, this image, Crunch Sand's image, just looks a lot more natural. And it's funny to say because I mean it was still created in Blender, mm -hmm. so it's not like a, a picture picture, but it's like you know it's a render. The card sizes actually look a lot more natural too. I don't know if you could tell. It just, I mean, it was it's just a like, better in the original. They're too big. Image altogether. Yeah. The lighting looks better. It's just not as, like, weirdly... Just, it's that Uncanny Valley thing. These AI pictures. I can't stand AI art, but y'all knew that. All right. Well, that concludes the stories. Sorry we didn't get to really cover too much because we were talking about so much Yu-Gi-Oh! today. Oh, no. The pot of greed covered Yu-Gi-Oh! I know. They'll just be so upset with us. Okay, <laughs> time to reach into the pot and well, answer some questions. Hope we have enough in here. We should. Forgot to go and update it before this oh, podcast. That's not we've one. certainly got um Okay, I got one. Lots of good questions, I think. Thank you guys for submitting these. Remember that you can always submit your topics and questions at the Google form linked below if you want us to chat about it on the pod. Let's hear what you got to say. All right. So are modern Yu-Gi-Oh decks too reliable? Too reliable. I wonder what they mean by that. I mean uh, to me. Do they take out too much of the RNG in this card game? Yes, I'm inclined to say yes. Um, what about you? I I, I do agree. Um, you know, I was actually playing Spades not too long ago with my family. You know, and, and you know, fifty two card games; those are all RNG. Mm -hmm. You know, just pure statistics at play. But when we play modern Yu-Gi-Oh decks, our decks do so much to shave off as much chance as humanly possible. I was going to say, yeah, from a consistency point of view, definitely so. Like, there's, modern decks are just so consistent. Most decks have, you know, a monster that, like, searches everything, a spell that searches everything, and then usually some alternative way of maybe even getting to the thing. Like, your Lone Fire Blossom like, type of card. We all get so mad when our decks don't give us the cards that we want to see, and so we lose... But, you know, that's actually it's kind of a point of a card game. I was also going to mention something related to the whole reliability thing is um, I think that, and I've been able to really, like, tell this as I've played more Master Duel, actually, is, just like, I think sometimes decks are too reliable in the sense that they can get around everything. And I'll explain that a little more, but what I mean is, like, there's kind of this expectation in modern Yu-Gi-Oh that no matter how big a monster gets, like how many attack points, you can always do something that swings over it. Or if a monster's unaffected by anything, there's always a way you can like get around it, make Underworld Goddess with it, you know, tribute it for a kaiju, whatever, right? And that no matter how many kind of things you lose, you can always bounce back from an interruption. You can bounce back. It can, I, my deck can play through Ash. My deck can play through an Imperm. You know, I can, I can still do this one combo under Droll. And I sometimes think, like, that... I'm gonna get like a bit of flack for this, I know, but I sometimes think get it's okay to just be stopped. Like it's not it's like you okay should, to lose. It, it's not that you should, you know, not try to like kind of push through, but more like sometimes people get so upset with the idea that a card would ever make them have to like end their turn or make them have to, you know, just not win the game. 
because so many decks have so much gas. They can push through everything. Oh, you negated this. I can still summon this and push through this and search and do this line instead. Or, you know, my, my whole field got, like, wiped by Nibiru or whatever. Well, it's okay. I'm playing branded. All my cards come back in the end phase. And, like, there's so many, like, decks and cards and strategies where there's just always an answer, always the next step, always a solution to the problem. And it's fun, mostly, but I do sometimes think, like, I don't mind the idea of, like, some decks having certain weaknesses that other decks don't have. Like, maybe your deck has a weakness to this type of boss monster. It's a bad matchup for you. Right. And that's okay. Like, it's okay that some matchups aren't advantageous. Obviously, you know, it would suck if it's, like, an impossible matchup, but there are very few of those, I would say, in Yu-Gi-Oh. I think it's just more so, to me, like, Let's just not, you know, get into our heads that every single duel has to be, like, infinitely winnable. Like, it's fine that they are, but I don't know if I'm making it. Do you get what I'm saying? I mean, I get it to an extent. Um, in, like, most competitive environments, you know, you would want the better player or the better deck to win 100% of the time. And that's in most competitive, like, industries. But I feel like, like you kind of said, I, I feel like that it doesn't have really a place in card games. I feel like if you want complete control and the ability to outmaneuver anything, you should play a different game. I think you should play chess, honestly. I think you should play, like, maybe fighting games, even. Like, I mean, you can I, play like, a fighting just, game. You can play chess. Play something else. I don't know. But I won't go too deep into that. I mean, it's just, it's more of a general, like, musing mm-hmm. I have. I guess I just, I've played so much Master Duel and stuff where I'm just like, man... These decks just keep pushing. Like, they just, they keep, like, you sometimes you feel like you've got them dead to rights, and they just keep going, and they keep going, and they keep going, and it's oh, like... Oh, this is not a criticism of combo decks again. Yeah. Ooh, oh, boy, actually, he always gets well, there, Well, what's yo. interesting is, like, I mean... No, but I'm being serious, though. Like, I do think a lot of these decks can just go too hard sometimes. Mm-hmm. I actually don't think that's limited to combo decks, either. I sometimes feel like, even, like, with a deck like Labyrinth, you know, like, I, I've played against them, and, like, it's kind of more control, but it's like, man... They get, like, everything back. And so it just feels like you're never quite able to, like, pin these decks down. And I think building in some weaknesses into decks isn't a bad thing. So, anywho, uh, MTG has two-sided cards. Could Yu-Gi-Oh do this, too? That would be a ruling nightmare. I don't think that Yu-Gi-Oh could ever do two-sided cards. I don't want to put our judges through that, honestly. Okay, can you tell me a little bit about how the two-sided cards work? Do you know uh, anything about, like, what are Yeah, the, I've seen a few. What's the format they're used in? So, what are I, mean, the rules? I mean, there's many formats. But, for the most part, a card has a, kind of a primary side and a secondary side where it usually transforms using some mechanic okay. and you flip it around. And when you say flip it around, so that it has to be in a clear sleeve then. No, uh, you would just take it out. You the take sleeve it out the sleeve around. and flip it around. Yeah. Yu Gi Oh can never. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Yu Gi Oh gets way too anal about stuff like that. Like, people are already turn like shark over, like your sleeves are a slight, like one slightly bent or something, or, or just that's the weight of the uh, card. That's how it goes in Magic. Also, now let, let's leave the logistics out of it. Do you think that this could work just as like a concept, ignoring the logistic problems, maybe? No. Okay, why not? Uh, that will give us another, like, huge kind of mechanic in Yu-Gi-Oh! that would have to be accounted for. Mm-hmm. This would, I don't know if this, this would be a new extra deck monster, maybe, or in a main deck. I don't know. Because it, it would be unable to be flipped face down, or it would have a new type of interaction with being face down. Like, if this card gets flipped face down, it's not a different card. And... Uh, uh, I don't want to deal my, with anymore. So my fear, and I guess this still is a logistic fear, that is too goddamn much text. Because like I'm sorry, <laughs> but in sides. Yu-Gi-Oh, like we already have a big problem with like, text. The font small, and there's like, a lot of text. I'll give you in these an example cards. of how an effect might like might read for that. So if this card gets targeted by a monster, if I flip this card over and apply the appropriate effect by what kind of card is targeting it, and the card, when this card gets flipped over, activate this effect, and then if this card is being targeted by a monster effect, activate this effect. <laughs> And like then, you, uh, at the end phase of next turn, flip this card back over. And when that card gets flipped over, it has an effect that activates when it gets flipped over. Dude, imagine, like, two-sided pendulums. No. Right? You can't. Like, where it's just, like, these pendulum monsters that just have, like, long... I do it. Like, imagine a two-sided Mighty Master of Magic or whatever. And Demi and the Mighty Master imagine of Magic. Imagine a two-sided Link monster. Yeah. It it's got both. different arrows. Yeah. Lord. <laughs> but, okay. I will humor it really quickly and just say that the concept sounds neat. Mm-hmm. But, like, man, oh, man, I just think Yu-Gi-Oh does not have the bandwidth for it right now. Like, we, uh, it's rough. It's, that'd be a lot, yo. It's rough. That'd be a lot. 
All right. Should casual Yu-Gi-Oh be given a different ban list since the current Forbidden and Limited list focuses on high-level play? That's interesting. This, Before I can even begin to answer it, I have to ask the number one question. It always comes up. So what is casual Yu-Gi-Oh exactly? Great question. Yeah, and that's not rhetorical either, by the way. Like, I, I just, I don't know that we have defined casual Yu-Gi-Oh effectively, and I don't know that we ever really can. Like, is that the traditional format? Do we just, here, guys, do what you want. <laughs> well, you know, earlier, like two hours ago or so, we said, you know, that, like, truly casual Yu-Gi-Oh players don't actually, like, wouldn't even know about a ban list like this. They like, does that make sense? It. Like, so even if we made like a casuals only ban list, the truly casual player wouldn't know about that either, so because I, they only maybe play Yu Gi Oh once every couple of months, maybe, and like they probably just collect for fun. They have one deck they made years ago. Like, I just don't know. But anyways, okay, so like I think in context of this question, they're at, they're speaking as if someone who follows Yu Gi Oh, but they don't necessarily compete at the highest yeah, levels of they Yu-Gi-Oh. deem themselves a more like, that kind of a casual Yu-Gi-Oh player should they get their own uh forbidden and limited list and in short i will say no i guess i'm wondering what would it be that's like, why i say no would would a would this would it be like a less restrictive list like oh more cards are off so it's like therefore more like fun or would it actually be a more restrictive list so that we're like we're gonna say cut out there's no Barone, there's no Hand Traps, there's no Evenly. Because if that's the case, I mean, I guess, like, maybe that's better? I don't know. To avoid that entire conversation, my answer is no. no. Why no? Like Because that's too much effort. It's just too much. For, like... Effort it's for who? For, an un- for whoever has to, like, make these decisions. To make a ban list for this undefined group of people mm-hmm. that... Where the with a moving target, depending on who considers themselves casual today. Yeah, I also think, and maybe I'm just I can't like, I'm maybe I'm just harping on like a dead point here. But like, if you play the casual ban list, isn't that kind of like an oxymoron? Like, like, do you get what I mean? Like, it's just because if I'm you'd be competing casually because like you're competing casually. So, like, if you're truly casual, then there just kind of wouldn't be a need for a ban list. Why are you even following the ban list to begin with? And again, I'm not trying to, like, ask trick questions here. I'm just being serious. Like, if they make a casual, it's what you said. If someone goes to the trouble of, like, kind of trying to define what they're trying to make a ban list for, this group of, this moving target of people, and then they're using that ban list, then, like, it's still a competitive format. Right? Yeah, at that point... so maybe the question should be, should there be another format for people who don't like playing the advanced, advanced format. format? And to that, I would say, sure. I mean, I think I everyone agrees with it, that. I don't know for sure. Yeah, no, yeah. What, what exactly that is, I mean, they've tried hard to the underdog, but Konami tends to like saying, here, the store can figure it out. Yeah, here you go. We made because, the format go. Because, well, Konami can't also, can't very well admit that they have an unbalanced game. That's kind of their thing, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, if we admit that like these certain cards are the problem and like make this casual format where like those cards aren't allowed then that's like kind of saying oh well we fucked up you know we made these cards oh. strong on purpose yeah we something. did it on purpose because we're malicious and it also shows that we're aware like that we are aware of what we made too strong and so now we you know what i mean like because if it's on just the forbidden and limited list it's the, the implication it gets a little meta but the forbidden and limited list implication is that th- it's like for mistakes, mm-hmm. right? Oh, this card is a mistake and it got exploited, and so we had to put it on the list. A lot of mistakes in Yu-Gi-Oh. It was a mistake, and the players caused it to be exploited, so that's why it ruined the Look tournament experience. Did. And we had to put it on the ban list, right? Because these these players were OTKing with magical scientists. We didn't intend it for it used that way, but it's a little different today, isn't it? Because I mean, like, I mean, look how many link monsters are. Yeah, on there. Konami, they're, they're designing the link monsters. They're designing Snake Eye or whatever like the current top deck is. And so when inevitably Wanted goes to one, it well, Konami knew from conception that Wanted would go to one. Yeah, like, you no, know. They're like, what? We didn't realize you guys would use it in everything. Or at least, you know, maybe that's presumptuous of me to say, but, like, I think that the ban list, po- like, pre-kind of 2010, maybe, or 2000, yeah, like 2010, 
you could say that these were maybe just mistakes or cars that just mm-hmm. ended up being stronger than anticipated. But kind of in this last decade or so, I mean, I think we all kind of know like cars are designed or archetypes are designed to be quite strong. Wasn't uh, There was not a single mistake made. Yeah, I don't think that a lot of these things are mistakes per se. Anywho. What you got? But yeah, my final thing just on that question though is I, I don't know that there could be a casual only ban list. I just, I don't know what the target is there, so. Anywho, another uh, ban list related question. Why does the semi-limited list have more effect in Master Duel than it does in the real-life TCG? Okay, I think that would make sense. Kind of I, an interesting one. I think, uh, because we've been talking about this for some years with the um, with the advanced format, the semi-limited list seemingly has less and less impact because problem cars don't need to be at two, they need to be at one or none. We don't, like... Putting cards at two isn't too useful in the advanced format. The game's but, very consistent, yeah. But the uh, ex- the opposite is true for Master Duel because it's more statistics and analytical. They can actually break down the actual distribution of cards that are winning games, yeah. and they can even they can estimate the impact of taking even just one copy of a card away from a deck. And the, they're looking at this from a statistical point of view. They can drop cards to two because they know that they'll drop a deck's winning percentage down by like two or even like four points. And yep. that's considered successful for them. We can't do that in the TCG. We don't even have the tools to do it. Yeah, what's interesting about that is a lot of people don't consider that. Yeah, and the TCG, Konami doesn't actually have like stats on deck list and stuff. They have it for like a YCS, sure, like a mm-hmm. regional. Like they take the deck list, but... It's they don't really have stats on like deck lists really in depth and certainly not on like how the games play out. Like, they can't say at the beginning of YCS. So one hundred percent of all the players have an Ash Blossom in their deck. Yeah, like they can know kind of what maybe judges report as like, oh, here's kind of the decks that are showing up a lot, or the card interactions that are maybe causing some problems, or being, you know, they're kind of overbearing. And like they know what's like in the feature match tables and stuff. But generally, they don't really know like how cards individually are like performing statistically, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. I think that with Master Duel, um, the semi-limited list works better. I'm not even gonna say it's perfect because I don't, you know, that's sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But like, I think that it ha- it shows more effect because thousands upon thousands upon thousands of games are just getting played, and they've got the data on. All of it. Yep. It just all just being added to somebody's like spreadsheet or database. So they know that, you know, a card going from three to two might very minusculely affect the win rate of like Labyrinth, right? When they mm-hmm. put, um, what's like Stovey Torby or whatever to two, like from three. It feels like it makes no difference, right? Because Shandra Aglier does the same thing and like, you know, whatever. But for them, that probably made like a one to two percent win rate difference or something among Labyrinth players, and that's all they wanted. Because they can really, <clears throat> unlike in the TCG, Mass Duel can look for a bell curve in for, for deck performance. Right. You guys know the bell curve is the like the normal distribution that most things look to emulate when they look at performance. And Mass Duel, because it's all digital, it's all statistical. They can actually try to yeah. force their game into a bit of a bell curve as far as how decks perform. And that means that can just mean making a deck win 5% more or 5% less. Yeah, and sometimes even like 1% or 2%. Yeah, like those they only need the smallest like, shaving we, percents. Got, and just to be clear, guys, we have not seen behind this curtain. We haven't been to yeah, the this is, this is, Duel studio or anything. Yeah, this is literally this is just purely guesswork. conjecture. I mean, it could be wrong. One thing completely uh, wrong. One thing that I will add to that, just real quick too, is I think like Master Duel also uses the semi limited list because in their view, like because ban lists come out more frequently, mm-hmm. it's okay to kind of just make micro adjustments and like kind of s- slowly push or pull at the format because like when you and you think about like the TCG, we're gonna have like a given format for three months, and right. so if they make a change in the list, it's gonna affect a lot of people and it's gonna be kind of like stuck. They can do e ban lists, but that obviously doesn't happen very often. So, like, I think for them, they know that they have to kind of make sweeping changes. So, it has to go to one. So, it has to go banned. Sometimes, occasionally, maybe go to two. But, like, with Master Duel, it's like, okay, you can put something in two, and if it makes no impact, then in, like, three weeks, there might be another banless announcement. We had banless announcements within, like, two weeks of each other in Master Duel. And, like, they are, because of that very statistical way they look at the game, we'll see fewer and fewer cards just fly to zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Master Duel, they really fight with their list. I mean, yeah, look how long it took for a lot of the Tiaramet cards to actually hit 
Yeah, uh, like forbidden. hit the ban list. Yeah, I mean, also, um, there's one last point I was going to say about it. I think Master Duel prioritizes mini decks being playable in some fashion. Right. So they feel like they're very, very resistive to, like, banning archetype cards. They'll eventually get around to banning, like, your block dragons and your chaos rulers and stuff. If they just absolutely have If to. they must. But they don't typically, like ban like cast your rise heart let's go or things like that like they didn't ban you know kit Kalos like the tcg did because nope. i think that they still want people to be able to build a tr elements deck mm -hmm. or build a, a whatever you know insert thing deck so i think by and because they aren't maybe hitting boss monsters they feel that the next best thing is to kind of shave stuff down to like two or one they'll thing hit everything they in your engine it can be a little annoying. I know this kind of gets back to that whole like master duel ban list. Deck list you know. looks like Swiss cheese when they're done with it. Yeah, they, they really they mess these decks up a little bit. They'll put stuff to two, they'll put stuff to one, and really mess it around. But I do think um, it, you know, as a master duel player, I've just gotten used to it. I think it's just a, it's just an alternative take mm -hmm. on doing a ban list. Better in some ways, worse in others. Like if you don't like it, well, the TCG's there, so. And we're having a great time here. Yeah, but DCG's only on fire every other week. <laughs> anyway. Okay. But that is it for our pod of greed questions, which means that's the end of today's episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We hope you had fun. A lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! in this episode, kind of like last week. Um, but I think next week, presumably, things will have slowed down. Maybe. Maybe the world won't be on fire. Well, bonfires will be out then, so... Oh, I guess it will. That'd be a whole other conversation. Did you see the, the uh, bonfire alternate art someone made where it's like the money and the... Oh, I hadn't seen it. Oh, there's somebody altered the art of like bonfire where it's like a hand like dropping money like, into like the burning flame. burning money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can really tell. Uh, the player's feeling it, yeah. We're in it. But... So, hopefully you guys enjoyed. We'll see you next week. Make sure, as always, that you leave any positive likes, comments, reviews. If you're watching live on YouTube, we appreciate you. We do. Comments for the algorithm, thumbs up for the algorithm. Um, if you're listening on any of the different platforms that we're on, then a five star review will suffice, I believe. Drop any more questions in our form. All right, it's going to be it. We'll see you guys in the next one. Pass, Pass turn. turn.